What's up, guys? I'm Rasim from RossBirdTech.com, and today I got some awesome news. Today we're finally going to get a chance to code in assembly. Now, if you guys have been following me up until now, I've been teaching you the ins and outs of the programming language, but now we're finally going to get a chance to get our feet wet. Now, before we do anything, we got to download a program called MU8086. Now, we're going to open up our browser. In, this, in the address bar, we're going to type in www.emu8086.com. Hit enter. Now this is their main page. You're going to make sure you click on this yellow download link here. It's going to start downloading. Once it's finished downloading, you're going to extract the file into a folder. So you're going to let your file download. You're going to open up the folder where you extracted the file. You're going to click on the setup file and double click it. Click yes. Now I'm not going to install mine because I already have mine installed, but you're going to click next, next, yes, yes, next. But after it's finished downloading, you'll see a uh, MU8086 icon on your desktop. That means the download has been installed successfully. Now, so let's get started. Let's click on this link here. You're going to want to register the product. This is a free software, but you're still going to want to register it. Now, the first program we're going to run is a Hello World program. Now, I already have a sample code that I'm going to paste here. I'm going to also leave this sample code on my website and also on the description of this video. Now I'm going to explain to you guys what each section is doing. All right, guys, so let's get started. I'm going to describe to you everything that's going on. This first part here, we have a model of Tiny. The second part here, this is the code segment. The third part here, we're telling the program that we're starting off with an offset of 100H. This here is the main PRC near, and under here is the main stuff here. This is the, all the stuff that's going to be uh, moving different values between the different registers. So let's get started with this first part here. This is move command. This is moving the value of 0, 9, H into the register AH here. So this is moving this value into this register here. This is uh, the code for function to display a string. The second part here is moving the value of the offset message to the register dx. This is letting you know uh, that there's a string present and it'll ter terminate the string with this dollar symbol. So if you want to end the string, you have to end it with this uh, dollar symbol or else it's just going to print out a bunch of weird characters. This third part here is the int21h. This initiates the process. You do that before every like command basically. Uh, this, this next part here is moving the value of 4ch into the register ah. This is the function to terminate. This next part here, we're moving the value of 00, zero into the register al. And uh, we're using the int21h again to initiate that. Now, we're ending p here. This is ending the program here. But now here, this is where we're writing our message. We have to start off by writing message, hit space, write our data type, which is DB, hit space. We got to use th these uh, quotation marks to write our message in. So our, our message is going to be between these quotation marks. Our message here is hello world. And again, you have to end each string with this dollar symbol here. And this here, it's going to end the program. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit compile. I'm going to hit save. Now let's hit run. I'm going to press OK. As you can see, it worked. It printed out Hello World. Now again, I'm going to leave the sample code on my website and also in the description of this uh, video. So if you guys want to test it out. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. And also please subscribe to my channel to get more videos like this. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and in this tutorial I'm going to show you guys some simple input and output in assembly. So let's get started. Up here we have some directives. Here we have a model of small. This is the data directive with nothing in it. Underneath that is the code directive. Now in the code directive we have a bunch of lines of code. I'm going to describe what each one of these lines of code are doing. Let's start with the first one over here, move into AH1H. Now this is uh, assembly code for read a character. Now. What this is doing is it's it's telling the program that we're going to enter a character and it's going to wait for that character until we enter it. So when we do enter that character, the character will be stored in the AL register. So remember that. This next line of code here, INC21H, is a DOS interrupt. What this is doing is just telling the program to initiate this here. Underneath that, we're moving the value of AL into DL. 
again, ALs were, were our character is stored, and we're moving it into DL. I'll explain this step a little bit later. So let's just skip onto this here. Move 2H into AH. That's the code for read a character. So when this is initiated, it's going to look, look in the D DL register, and it's going to print whatever's in a DL register. That's the main reason I, we moved AL into DL. So when we get to this step, it's going to print our character in DL. So again, underneath that is the INC 21H, which basically initiates this code here, and it's going to display our character on the screen. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate, and I'm going to hit run. So right now it's waiting for us to enter a character. We're going to enter a character. I entered one, by the way. And uh, as you can see, entered one one. The reason why one one was entered, or just the reason why one one was displayed is because the first character uh, we entered one, it, uh, it saved it in the program in the AL register. We moved it from the AL register to the DL register, and we, we then printed it. So that's why it printed twice. So let's let's uh, let me go over this one more time. This first line of code here, move one H into A H, is the code for read a character. Again, it, this is going to tell the program that we're going to enter a character. Once we've entered that character, it's going to save it in the AL register. So uh, under it is the INT twenty one H. What it's doing, it's a DOS interrupt, and it's telling the program to initiate this. Underneath that, we're moving our character, which is saved in AL, into the, the DL register. Underneath that, this is the code for write a character. Move to H and to AH is, again, the code for write a character. So it's going to look inside the DL register. So whatever is stored in the DL register, it's going to print on the screen. So that's why, again, we moved AL into DL. And underneath that, INC 21H is a DOS interrupt, and it just initiates this, so it then it prints it on the screen. All right, so that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. And also, if you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissim from RossmoreTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rissim from RossmoreTech.com, and this is another tutorial on assembly programming. Now, I'm going to talk about registers and how they work. Now, I wanted to do a class on variables, but before we start variables, I wanted to make sure you guys understood how registers work, because they're very important. Now, let's get started. Now, up here, as you can see, this is the AX register. The AX register has 16 bits. Now, now the AX register is made up of two smaller portions, AH and AL. Each portion has 18 bits. AH stands for A high, AL stands for A low. Again, those two together make up AX. And now we have EAX. EAX is made up of AX with an added 16 bits to make it the 32 bits, so that's EAX. And the same thing with EBX, it's 32 bits, and 16 of those bits is the BX, which is broken up, again, into two smaller parts, which is BH, 8-bit, which is BH, 8-bit, which stands for B high, and uh, BL, 8-bits, which stands for B low, together make up BAX, add another 16 bits to that, you have a 32-bit register called EBX. Now again, the same thing with the ECX. You have 16 bits added onto CX, which is 16 bits, which is broken up into two pieces of 8 bit. CH is C high, CL is C low. Each each have 8 bits. Now we're down to EDX. EDX has 16 bits added onto another 16 bits, which is DX. DX is broken up into two pieces which is DH and DL stands for D high and D low, each have eight bits. And we have ESI, which is a 32-bit register, and EDI, which is also another 32-bit register. These here, these are the general purpose registers. Now underneath that, we have the stack pointer, which is ESP, which is also a 32-bit register. And we have the base pointer, which is EBP another 32-bit uh, register. Here it describes what each one of these registers special purpose is. AX is for multiply slash divide, string load, and store. CX is for count for string operations and shifts. DX is for port address for ins and outs. BX is for index registers for move. P is for points at the top of the stack. BP is to point to the bottom of the stack. Type points to the source and stream operations, the I points to destination and stream operations. And we also have IP instruction pointer and, uh, and flags.
right, that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed the video, please give this video a like. And also, if you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmoreTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rasim from RossmoreTech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. In this class, I'm going to show you guys how to print characters from the ASCII table and also how to do some simple math. So let's get started. Over here I have move into AH2H, that's the code for print the character. If you guys don't know what this means, you should watch my class on simple input and output. But again, this is the code for print the character. We all know that it'll print whatever is in the DL register, right? So let's give DL a value. I'm going to move into DL, the value of 2. So theoretically it should print 2, right? So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate, then I'm going to hit run. It didn't print to, it printed this weird character here. I'm going to explain to you guys what that means. I'm going to first open up my ASCII table I have here. Now again, so this is the ASCII table. This is basically giving us the value of a decimal to hexadecimal to character. The characters are what's going to print on the screen. These green things here are what's going to print on the screen. Now, we wanted the character 2 to print out on the screen, right? So the character 2 has a decimal value of 50 and a hexadecimal value of 32. So basically what that means is our, our value was 2. So we have to add another 48 to this to make it 50, so it prints out 2. So let's test it out. I'm going to add into DL. So I'm going to add 48 to the DL register to make it 50. So 2 plus 48 is 50. So it should print out uh, 2. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit run. As you can see, it worked. It printed out 2. Let's close this. Now, this is a decimal value here. The DL register now has a decimal value of 50 because we added 2 and 48. Now, if we added an H to this here, this would be a 48 hexadecimal. So let's open up our table again. Now let's go back to that character 2. That character 2 has a hexadecimal value of 32. So let's test it out. I'm going to change this to a 30, add an H to make the hexadecimal, and add an H to the 2 to make that a hexadecimal value. So these two here should add up to 32 hexadecimal 32. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate. I'm going to hit run. And it printed out too. Cool, right? Let's close this. I'm going to leave a link to this ASCII table if you guys want to practice on your own. So let's do some simple math. So I'm just going to delete this here. Delete the H because I, I don't want this to be a hexadecimal. I want it to be a decimal value, right? So basically, again, we need to make sure that... First, we need to make sure that um, we have a value of 50 to print out a 2. So let's add again to DL the value of 48. So it's going to print that too. So this 48 is going to be our base right now. So we could just move this down. Here. Sorry. All right, so this 48 here is going to be our base. So we can just move this down here. So let's do some simple math. So right now, our DL register has a value of 2. Let's say we wanted to add another 2 to this to make it 4. All we would have to do is add into DL. Well, more than four. The character that prints on the screen should be four because remember we added another 48 here so it should print the character four. Let's test it out. I'm gonna hit run. It worked, it printed out four. Now I'll say we wanted to subtract. I'll show you guys how to do it right now. Let me just close all this up here. Let's change this into subtract. So the code for subtract would be SUB. And let's subtract the value, uh, so let's subtract the decimal value of 1. So 2 take away 1 should be 1, right? So say emulate, I'm going to hit run, and it worked, they printed out run. Pretty cool, right? Again, I'm going to leave a link to this ASCII table so you guys practice on your own. But it's real simple stuff once you get it. All right, so that's pretty much it. If you guys like this tutorial, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RasmerTech.com, and thanks for watching.
What's up guys, I'm Arsene from RossmerTech.com and in this tutorial I'm going to be talking about defining data and how to use variables. So let's get started. All right, before we start coding, I want to explain to you guys what a data definition statement is. The statement starts off with a name, a name we give uh, a variable, then we hit space, then we give it a directive initializer. Then we hit space again and then we got to give it an initializer. So I have an example of one down here. So I use the name count1 hit space and uh, DB is our directive initializer which is a 16-bit value with 16-bit data type then we gave it a value of 1 so that's pretty much it. Alright guys I'm gonna explain to you now the different data types our first data type here is byte. Byte is an 8-bit unsigned integer meaning it has 8 bits and uh, it does not have a sign like negative or positive so S byte here is the same thing as byte but it has a signed meaning it has a negative or positive, and it's 8 bits. Now, word is a 16-bit unsigned integer. S word is a 16-bit signed integer, has a negative or positive. D word is a 32-bit unsigned integer. S D word has a 32-bit signed integer. F word is a 48-bit integer. Q word is a 64-bit integer. T byte is an 80-bit integer. Real 4 is a 32-bit integer. Real 8 is a 64-bit integer. Real 10 is an 80-bit integer. Now, we're going to be working mostly with uh, the legacy data directives. The DB, which is an 8-bit integer. DW, which is a 16-bit integer. DD, which is a 32-bit integer. DQ is a 64-bit integer. And DT is a 80-bit integer. So we're going to be working with uh, DB today. I'm going to show you guys how to code using DB and how to create a variable with DB. So let's get started. All right, guys, so this is basically the same program I showed you in my last video, ASCII table and a simple math. So basically, it's the same thing. The only difference is now I just added a variable here. So if you guys want to watch my last video so you could catch up, then come back to this video, feel free. But yeah, I just added a variable now. I, I named my variable count1 and it has a uh, data type db which is an 8-bit data type and I gave it an integer value of 2 so my, so my variable count1 has a 8-bit value of 2 so let's look down here so down here uh, we're moving my variable count1 into the deal register the reason we're doing that is because if you watch my last video you know that when we print a character we, it prints the value from the deal register and to that we're adding 48 to the deal register. The reason we're doing that is, is so we can print the character 2 here. So if you guys are confused with that, just watch my last video and you'll be caught right up. And underneath here is the, this is the code for print the character. Move into AH2H, INT21H. This is the code for print the character. So it's going to print whatever's in the deal register, the value of the deal register. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate here. Then I'm going to hit run. As you can see, it's really small, but it printed out the character 2. That's pretty cool, right? Guys, that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. And if you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. In this class, I'm going to talk about the move instruction and the rules we have to follow. So let's get started. Let's first talk about how the move instruction works and looks. First, we have the move instruction here, which is the MOV. Then next, we have the destination operand. Then we use a, a comma after that. We hit space. Then we have the source operand. So basically what, how this works, the source operand moves into the destination operand. So the destination operand is basically equal to the source operand. So now there's certain rules we have to follow with the move instruction itself. So the first one, the first rule we have to follow is both operands must be the same size. I'm going to give you guys an example of that right now. I'm going to enter a couple times. I'm going to use the move instruction. Hit space. Now I'm going to use the AX register, use a comma, hit space again, and use the AH register. All right, basically this won't work because the AX register is a 16-bit register and the AH register is a 8-bit register, so this won't work. So this will work. So if you move into AHAL, this will work because they're both 8-bit registers. Or if we move into AX, BX, this will work because both these registers are 16-bit registers. So let's get back to the rules. Now, the second rule is both operands cannot be memory operands. I'll explain what that is right now. Let's first delete this here. All right, so we're going to use the move instruction again. 
I'm going to uh, use a variable name. Variable one, hit comma. I'm going to use another variable name. Now, these two here, they are memory operands, right? We cannot move one memory operand into another one. So this won't work. If you want to get the value of one memory operand into another, there's only one way to do it. We have to use registers. So I'll show you guys how to do that right now. We're going to use the move instruction. And we're going to move into BX, the variable two. Right? So now the, the value of the variable two is in BX. So now we can move into variable one bx it's pretty much the same thing but like we, we can't directly move one uh, memory operand into another we have to use registers in between then we could get the value into the register we want so that's how that works now rule three the cs the eip and the ip registers cannot be destination operands now the next rule is an immediate value cannot be moved into a segment register so let's let's look at some examples of some uh, move instructions here. We can move uh, one register into another register. That's fine. We can move into a memory uh, register. So that's fine. We can move into a register memory location. That is fine. We can move into a memory. We can move into memory an immediate value. That'll work. And we can move into a register an immediate value. So that'll work. So that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. And if you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmoreTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rasim from RossmoreTech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now, in this class, I'm going to show you guys how to move smaller value into larger value. So let's get started. Let's open this up first. Now, I'm going to give you guys an example. Let's say we wanted to move into AX. AL, right? This won't work. This won't work because AX is a 16-bit register and AL is an 8-bit register. We can't move a smaller bit register into a larger bit register. We can't move a smaller value into a larger value, right? Technically, yes, but there's a way around it. Now, programmers call this a workaround. I'll show you guys how to do that right now. I have an example above here. Okay, this is variable one. Variable one has a size of a data byte. A data byte is eight bits and I gave this variable a value of one, right? So now let's say we wanted to move this variable, which is an eight bit value into a 16 bit register like AX, right? Technically you can't directly do it. So I won't be able to move into AX variable one. It won't work, right? The reason why this won't work is this is, has this eight bit value and this register is a 16 bit register. So now let's show you the workaround. Now, the first thing we need to do, right, is set the AX to zero. To set the AX to zero, all we have to do is move zero into AX. And I'm gonna show you guys how that works. Now, here is, this is AX here, right? This is the AX register. It's a 16-bit register. Now, when we move zero into AX, it zeroes all the bits out. So 16 bits turn to zero, right? Now, the next step would be to move the variable into AL, right? So we know our, our variable has a value of one. So the reason we're moving it into AL, AL is the register with the last bits. So we know this is the ones place here, right? So we, this will turn to one. Now, the reason why this works is because this is the AL register, right? This has eight bits and the last bit is the ones place. It'll, so one, in the ones place will make this a one. But again, we zeroed out the entire register, right? So technically the entire register has a value of one. This entire AX register has a value of one. So that's the way around it. Now there's another way around it. You can guys can do this with a uh, bigger values. So let's say, let's make this a data word, right? Which is a 16 bit value. So now our variable one has a 16 bit value of one, right? Now let's change AX into EAX, which is a 32 bit register. And let's change AL into AX. It's the same principle. Now this is EAX, right? EAX is a 32 bit register. You have to move zero into EAX, which would zero it completely out. Then we would move our variable 
BAR1, which is a 16-bit value, into the AX register. So what that that would do, it that would, this again, this is the once place for AX, right? So this would turn AX into the value one, but this is also the once place for EAX because AX is the, the last bits of this register, right? So theoretically, EAX would have the value of one to now. So again, that's another way around it. This is a way to move smaller values into larger values. So if you guys you do need to move smaller values into larger values, this is the way to do it. Now, that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about increment and decrement. So let's get started. Now this is going to be a very fast, simple class because it's really easy to do. Now, this is a program uh, I showed you guys in uh, one of my tutorials, the ASCII table and simple math. Now, if you guys haven't watched that uh, video, please watch it before you move on to this step. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be lost. But yeah, this is the same program we used here. And uh, what this program did was uh, print the character three on the screen. Now, let's say we want to increment uh, a register or increment a value. We can do that. Uh, the, the increment code is INC. I'm going to show you guys how to do that right now. So first, first off, let's print this on the screen right now. It should print out the three because we're moving into DL the value three, right? But it's not the character three, it's the integer value three. We're using add into DL 48, we're adding 48 into the DL to convert it into character three. I showed you guys that in the ASCII table. Again, if you guys are confused, just watch that video and you'll be caught right up. And um, move into AH, 2H is the code for print character. So what is what this is doing is it's just printing the character three on the screen. This is the integer value three we're adding 48 to it to convert it to character three. So it prints character three on the screen. So let's let's hit emulate. Now let's hit run and see what happens. All right, as you, as you can see, it printed out the character three, right? Now, let's say we want to increment the register or the value by one. We can use something called INC increment. Now, we don't want to put it the INC or increment before the move into uh, DL3. Because if we if I put INC DL right because that's the code for uh, increment, what what this is going to do is it's going to increment DL by one. So the value of DL will, would be one. But once you move use this move command uh, the value three into DL, it's going to completely overwrite this increment. So I'm going to show you guys right now. I'm just going to hit uh, I'm going to hit emulate here and I'll hit run. It should print out three. It hit, printed out three because it completely overwritten this increment. So again, I'm going to copy this here, and we we want to put the increment after the move, the, th uh, the value three into the DL. So let's try it out now. Oops, run. As you can see, it printed out four. It, it incremented by one. So that's pretty much it for increment. Now let's talk about decrement. Now it's the it's the exact opposite. It it subtracts one from the value. So all you have to do is uh, all we have to do is delete that and type in DEC. It's the code for decrement. It should decrement the value by one. So it should be value two because we de decremented three from one and it should be two. So let's hit emulate, hit run, and it worked. The value is two. So yeah, so that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now, in this class, I'm going to talk about the add and subtract instruction. So let's get started. As you can see, I have the MU8086 program open right now. I highly recommend this program. If you guys have been following me, following all my tutorials and assembly programming, I highly recommend you, you use this program. And now you, at first you'll, you will download the free trial, but after a while you're gonna have to uh, buy a license. Now each license is about, like a user, single user license is about $5 and you, you'll have this forever. So I highly, highly recommend you get this program because it has some pretty awesome features that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So let's get started. Let's start with the add instruction. First, let's move 
into CL, the value 5, right? So let's see what happens when we do that. Let's, let's see how the registers react. So we're going to hit emulate. On the left here, we have all the registers right here, right? And it'll tell you the value of each register. Into CL, the value 5. Let's hit next step to see what happens to the register. As you can see, our, this is CX here. CX is a 16-bit register, which consists of CH and CL, right? When we move 5 into CL, now our CL register has a value of 5. So that's pretty cool. Now let's see what happens when we use the add instruction. Now I'm going to add into CL 2. Let's close this here and hit emulate again. Let's hit next step. The first step, now our CL register here has a value of 5. Let's hit the next step. And now our CL register has a value of 7 because we added into CL2. Now, th there's something you should be very, very careful with when you're using move and add. Now, when you're using move, anytime you move uh, a, a one value into a register, it completely erases the register and just keeps that specific value. I'm going to show you guys what happens when I add a third line here and I'm going to move into CL1, right? Oops. Move into CL1. Let's close this. Let's hit emulate again. Our first step, we moved into CL5. So our, our CL uh, register has a value of 5. Our next step, we added 2 to the CL register. Now our, our now our CL register has a value of 7. But our third, third step here, we moved one into CL. We used the move instruction. So let's hit next step. Again, it completely erased these two steps. Now our CL register has a value of one because we moved. Every time you use the move instruction, the register, the destination register will always be overwritten. So you got to be careful with that. Now let's talk about the subtract, the sub instruction. Let's just delete these two lines here. I'm going to keep the move into uh, CL5. Now SUB is our subtract instruction code. And we're going to use CL register again. Now I'm going to subtract 2 from the CL register. So right now our first step, remember, the CL register has a value of 5. When, we, when this step is initiated, it'll subtract 2 from 5, so it should be 3. So let's hit emulate. Remember, first step, we moved into uh, CL, the value 5. So it, as you see, CL has a value 5. Our next step we subtract CL value 2. So now our CL register, as you can see, has a value of 3 because we subtract 5 and 2, which is 3. That's pretty much it. Remember, again, move instructions completely overwrite registers. Add adds value to the, to, the, to the register. Sub subtracts value from the register. All right, so that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissim from RossmoreTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmoreTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the NEG instruction. What is the NEG instruction? Well the NEG instruction reverses the signs of a number by converting the number to its two complements. Now, how do we convert a number to its two complements? I'm going to show you guys that right now. Here we have an 8-bit number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I need to add another 0. Clean this up a little bit. So now this is an 8 bit here. We're using 8 bits because uh, we're working with the 8 bit register. Now we have to, uh, okay, first let's give it a value. Let's say we're going to use 5. We want to negate 5. So, all right, so over here, this is decimal 5. And this uh, let's convert decimal 5 into binary 5. To do that, we have to first uh, use this table up here. We know that uh, binary is base 2, right? So 2 to the 0, which make it 1. 2 to the 1 would be 2. 2 to the 2 would be 4. So on and so forth. To make uh, this binary 5, we would have to uh, use the numbers we have available. We have 1 and we have 4, which would make 5, right? So this third bit here, we got to make this a 1, which is the 4 place. And the first place here... We make it a 1, because this is the 1's place. 4 plus 1 is 5, right? So now this is binary 5, right? So now this is 5. We want to negate this. We want to make this negative 5. To do that, first things first, we have to uh, invert all the binary bits. By inver What I mean by inverting is uh, zeros will be 1's and 1's will be zero. So let's do that right now. Whoops. Let's go down here. All right, so 
zero so this would be one 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 zero one zero right that's step one inverting all the bits right now step two is adding one so to do that we would do uh zero 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 one right so this is binary for one because this is the ones place right so we added one here and, and zero dot the rest so this is binary inverted five now we get we all right this is binary five right we inverted all the bits under here we made zeros ones and one zeros right now the last step is to add one to this so this would be the answer after we add one it would be uh one 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 zero one one right so this is inverted five or this is negated five so negative five right so let's test that out let's let's see if we were right let's go into our uh, binary program here right i already have this uh, program written so what we're doing now is we're moving the value five into CL. So CL is the eight bit register. That's why we used the eight bits over here. So right now, uh, the the value five is in CL. Now we use the NEG, the negate instruction, uh, CL. So this is negating five. Ne negating five is just bringing the number to its two's complement. So let's test it out. Let's hit emulate. All right. Now let's hit the first step. The first step now here. Our uh, CL register has a value of five, right? So let's hit the next step. When we, the next step, it's negating uh, the CL register. So now our uh, it has a value of FB, which is hexadecimal. So let's convert this FB hexadecimal to binary. I got this open here. So we're gonna go down. Oh, over here is the decimal. Here, the second row is the hexadecimal. I'm sorry, second column is the hexadecimal, and the last row is the binary. So we're looking for FB. FB, so we got to go all the way to the bottom. FB here. All right, here we go. Where's FB? So FB here, right? So this is the binary of FB. One, 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 zero, one, one. Let's see if it's the same thing. I'm going to copy it here, all right? And let's paste it down here. And it is one, 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 zero, one, one. It worked. So that's pretty much how you do it. Let's let's do a recap. First things first. We, we, we have a number, right? We start out with a number. That number, let's say five, right? We first invert all the, the digits. So zeros would be ones and ones would be zero. So in this case, it would be one, 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 zero, one, zero, right? Next step, we added one to this binary equation here. So this would be one, one, zero, one, 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 one. And this is negative five. So that's pretty much what this, I'm sorry, that's pretty much what this negate instruction does. It brings a number to its to its complement. Now, so that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about the CPU status flags and how arithmetic operations affect them. So let's get started. First, I'm going to open up my web browser. I have a wiki answers page open here. This I found was the best description of the status flag. I'm going to leave a link to this uh, URL in my description if you guys are interested. But the first flag we're going to talk about is the carry flag or CF. This flag is set to one when there is an unsigned overflow. I'm gonna give you guys an example of a unsigned overflow. Let's say we're working with eight bits, right? To overflow all eight bits, right? Let's say we have eight one bits first. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So this is basically two, five, five. To overflow this here, we would have to add another one to make it two, five, six, and that would uh, activate the overflow flag. So we, let's test it out right now. I'm going to move into CL because CL is the 8-bit register. 254. I'm sorry, 255 because we want to add one to overflow it. Then I'm going to add into CL 1. This should uh, make it 256 and this should overflow. So hit, let's hit emulate. 
Now let's open up the flags here so we can see how the flags are affected. Let's click on next step, then next step. And as you can see that carry flag is set to one because it overflowed. Now let's talk about the next status flag. Let's close this up here. The next status flag is the priority flag. This flag is set to one when there is an even number of one bits basically. All right, I'm gonna give you guys an example of it down here. So let's say I add one, two, three, four, five, six, then the last two bits are one. See, this has an even number of one bits, right? So this is the ones place and this is the twos place. So the, the answer, the arithmetic answer, if they, let's say it is a three, then the priority flag is set. So let's test it out. Let's make this a two and keep this a one. So the answer is three, right? That will produce an even number of one bits in the, in the binary code. So let's hit emulate. Let's open up the flags again. Let's hit next step, next step. As you see, the priority flag is set to one. Let's talk about the next flag. The next flag is the auxiliary flag. Now the auxiliary flag is set to one when there's an unsigned overflow of low nibble bits, right? So I'm going to explain to you what that is right now. Basically, let's say we have a group of eight bits. Let's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's add, make another uh, set of eight down here. So the way the auxiliary uh, flag is set to one is if there was a carryover from the fourth to the fifth bit. So this is the fourth bit right here. I'm sorry, this is the fourth bit here, right? Let's say we. We set this one, we set this one. If we were adding these two right here, right? If we were adding these two, there would be a carryover to this fifth bit here. So this is the ones place, the twos place, this is the fourth place, and this is the eighth place here. So we would have to add eight with eight to set the auxiliary flag. Let's test it out right now. Let's delete this right here. Let's add this to eight. Let's uh, turn that to eight. So we're moving to CL eight and we're adding eight to it. So let's hit emulate. Let's open up the flags. Let's click on single step. Next step, as you can see, the auxiliary flag is set to one. Pretty simple, right? Again, I'm gonna do that one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because this can be confusing. I was confused in the beginning. So another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight bits here. So the fourth to the fifth bit. So this is the fourth bit right here, right? To get a carry, uh, both uh, sets of uh, binary have to be one, right? When you're adding. So one, one, one and one is zero carry one. We're carrying one. So let's hit down here. So basically one and one, let's, be, let's move this over here. So one and one would be zero carry one. So this would be one, right? So that's how the auxiliary flag is set because we added eight and eight, which was in the fourth place and carried one over to the fifth place. Pretty simple if you think about it. All right, let's talk about the next status flag. Now let's close this here. The next status flag is zero flag or ZF. This flag is set to one when there is an unsigned, I'm sorry, the zero flag, this flag is set to one when the result is a zero. So really easy. Let's say zero and we add zero to it. We know the answer is gonna be zero. So let's hit emulate. Let's open up the flags, let's hit next step, then next step. As you can see, the zero flag is set to one because the answer is zero. Pretty cool, right? Let's talk about the next status flag. Let's close this here. The next status flag is signed flag. Uh, this is set to one when the result of, is negative, right? But if we have a negative answer, the signed flag will be set to one. So let's say we move, uh, let's say we make this a negative one, right? And we make this a negative two, right? Well, it would be, it, this answer would be negative three, right? So let's hit emulate. Let's open up the flags. Let's hit next step, next step, and the sign flag is set to one because the answer is a negative answer. So let's talk about the next status flag. 
the next status flag and the last one I'm going to talk about, I'm going to skip these uh, three right here, is the overflow flag. Now the overflow flag is set to one when there is a signed overflow, a signed overflow. So meaning, let me just give you an example right here. So let's say um, th there is a number smaller than negative 3,000, I'll give you guys an example, smaller than negative 32,768, right? And again, when working with negative numbers, we have to uh, work with 16-bit uh, registers like AX, CX, and so on and so forth. Let's say if the answer is smaller than 32,768, then the overflow flag will be set. So let's, let's test it out right here. Let's make this... Uh, negative three two seven six eight right and let's hit uh the, we'll keep the negative two that's fine so let's delete this here so let's hit emulate let's make this a one i'm sorry again i'm working with uh, cl is an 8-bit register we have to make this a 16-bit register so let's make this cx let's turn this to cx that's why we got that error. Again, you can make this a negative two, that's fine. Let's clean this up a little bit. So let's hit emulate again. Now let's hit, uh, make sure the flags are open so we can see what's going on. Let's hit single step and single step and the uh, overflow flag is set to one. As easy as that. All right guys, so that's pretty much it for this tutorial. If you guys enjoyed this tutorial, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Ristin from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rissim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the jump instruction, JMP. So let's get started. Let's open up the program here. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is label. We have to create a jump label. You can name the label anything you want to name it. In this case I'm just going to call mine top. Now after you named the label, you have to uh, end it with a colon. The next thing we're going to do is uh, use the jump instruction. So the jump instruction is JMP. We're going to hit space and we're going to type in the label name. In this case, it's top. We do not use the colon when we're using the jump instruction. All right, so let me explain how this works. Now, this is the label, right? There's going to be some code here that's going to be executed first, right? Once it's finished executing the code, it's going to get to this jump part here, this jump instruction, and it's going to jump back to this label here. So then it's going to keep repeating the instruction in the middle, and it's going to jump back on top, so on and so forth. So let me demonstrate it. Let's uh, print a character on the screen. Let's print character 5. So we're going to move into the DL register, the value of 5. We're going to add 48. I'm sorry, we're going to add into DL 48. So we convert it to a character 5. Now we're going to use the print character code, which is move into a h 2 h right? That's the code for print the character. Then we're going to do int 21h. Let's hit emulate again. Let's hit run. As you can see, it's keep printing 5. It's going to keep going and going and going and going. So that's pretty much it for a jump instruction. You, you name a label. You can have a jump instruction anywhere in a program. It could be on the bottom. Again, it could jump to any part of the screen. Let me demonstrate that right now. So after this jump instruction, right? Let's uh, let's change this to, let's call this green, right? So we're gonna jump to a label green, but we haven't created that label yet. So let's, just uh, say we're going to copy some code here, right? We're going to copy some, let's just copy this code here, right? In instead of uh, five, let's print six on the screen, right? So it's six. So we're going to create another label. And this label, we're going to call green. So again, we're going to type in the label name and a colon because this is a label. So let's add some instruction under this and let's say we're going to copy this again. All right, so let's copy this again. And 
and let's paste another here and let's make this one a seven right so now what this is going to do we have a top label here right first it's going to execute this instruction here right then it's going to jump into green it's not going to jump back to here it's going to jump to the green label so it should skip this code here it should it should not print six it should skip six completely and jump to this green label here so then it's going to execute this green label here and then the program should end right there so it should print five and seven it should completely skip six because we 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 use this jump instruction and after this code is complete it's going to print five this jump instruction is initiated it's going to look for the jump label so the jump labels all the way i'm sorry it's going to look for the green label the green label is all the way over here right so it's going to skip this completely so it just should print five and seven so let's just test it out right now let's hit emulate i'm going to hit run hit ok and it printed out five and seven as you can see and then the program ended the program ended because there is no more jump label so there was nothing to jump to pretty cool right so again you can jump to any spot in the in the screen it doesn't have to be on top it doesn't have to be in the bottom you could be in the bottom and jump on the top you could be in the top and, and jump to the bottom it doesn't make a difference so that's the cool thing about this instruction all right guys so that's pretty much it for this tutorial if you guys like this video please give me a like if you want more videos like this please subscribe to my channel i'm Rasim from rossmartech.com and thanks for watching What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the loop instruction. So let's get started. Let's open up MU8086. Now this is the way a loop instruction should look. You should first uh, create a label name. You can name it whatever you want. I'm going to call my top and it has to end with a colon, right? And the loop instruction is going to end with the actual loop instruction with which is L O O P hit space and type in the label name, which is top in this case, you can name it whatever you want. So this is the shell of a loop instruction, right? Now the way it works, it uses the CX register as a counter. It'll keep running the loop until the CX register is equal to zero, then the loop stops. So you can type up anything in, the, in between here and until the C X register is equal to zero, it'll keep the loop going. So I'm going to give you guys an example of that right now. So let's uh, let's make it print five on the screen. So first thing I want to do is move into uh, DL, the value of five, right? Then we're going to add into DL 48, so it converts it to character five. So it, it prints character five on the screen. Now let's use the print character code, which is move into AH. 2h right then we're going to do an int 21h now here this is the code for print character on the screen it's, it prints whatever is in the dl register so that's why we moved integer value 5 into dl we added 48 to dl to, to convert it to character 5 this is the print character instruction so it should print character 5 on the screen right so the way the, the loop works it's going to keep printing 5 on the screen until the loop ends let's give the CX register a value. So we, we have to give the value of the CX register outside the loop. I'm going to show you guys why in a second. So first let's uh, move into CX, the value of five, right? So now the CX register has a value of five. So basically when we run the program, it should print the character five, five times, right? Now, the first thing this loop instruction does, it subtracts one from the CX register. Then it also compares uh, CX to zero. If CX doesn't equal zero, the loop continues, right? So the loop will just jump back to this label spot here, right? So let's get started. Let's hit emulate. Let's hit run. As you can see, it printed out five, five times, right? So that's the way it works. Again. Uh, it, it'll uh, do whatever's in here, right? It, once it gets to this loop instruction, it subtracts one from CX. Then it makes sure that C, CX is not equal to zero. If CX is not equal to zero, it continues back to this top or this, to wherever label and it keeps going until CX is equal to zero. So uh, let me oh, demonstrate something else. 
A uh, common error I, I see a lot is people uh, try to give a CX a value inside this loop instruction here. Now let's say I move into CX, right? The value of five inside this loop instruction here. What's going to happen is that loop is going to continue and it's going to never end because it's going to keep adding five to CX in the loop. So let's hit emulate to test it out. Let's hit run. As you can see, it just keeps going and going and going. It'll never stop. Or if you guys uh, use the increment CX in here, it's never going to end either because it's going to keep incrementing one to CX. So let's hit play. Let's hit run again. As you can see, it's going to keep going and going. Every t anytime you guys want to uh, give CX a value, you have to do it outside the label. So you have to do it outside the label and have it on top of here somewhere. All right, so that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rissim from RossmerTech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now, in this class, I'm going to talk about nested loops. So let's get started. Let's open up MU8086. Now, if you guys watched my last video, you guys know that uh, this is the, the structure of a loop, right? You have to have a label first, right? You can name your label whatever you want. I'm going to call mine L1. And each label has to end with a colon, right? And the loop ends with the loop instruction. So L-O-O-P is the loop instruction. Hit space and type in the label name without the colon. So L1, no colon. So this is a structure of a loop, right? Now, the way a nested loop works is it's actually another loop within this loop. So I'm going to hit enter a couple times. So let's uh, create another label. Let's call this one uh, L2, right? Use the colon. And we have to end this loop with a loop instruction as well. So L O O P L2. Now we have two loops, one loop inside the L1 loop here, right? So this is a nested loop. This is the structure of a nested loop, right? Now, again, the first thing we got to do is. Um, give a value to CX. We learned that in the last tutorial. We know that CX is the counter. Every time CX hits a loop, it decrements the CX register. So every time this loop instruction is initiated or any loop instruction is initiated, it decrements CX and it also compares CX to zero. If CX does not equal zero, it continues the loop, right? So again, we got to give CX a value. So let's give CX a value of, let's say five. Right, so now uh, CX has a value of five. So now we got to do something within this part here. Let's add, let's add the print character uh, code here, so we can print the character on the screen. We know the uh, that we have to uh, move into DL a value, right? That we want to print on the screen. So let's print one on the screen. We know we have to add into DL forty-eight, so it prints character uh, one on the screen, right? All right, now we're going to have to uh, type in the print character code, which is move into a h, right? 2h. That's the code for print character on the screen. Well, the way this works, it, it looks in the deal register, and it'll print whatever is in the deal register. We also have to use the int 21h to initiate it, right? So basically, this code here, it's going to print character 1 on the screen, right? So the way the program works now, the program is going to start. It initially has a value of 5, right? Because we gave CX a value of 5. We know CX is a counter, right? So it's going to go down here. It's going to print character 1 on the screen, right? Now it's going to go down here, right? So now let's add something to this uh, second loop here. Now let's add another print character code in here. Let's move into DL, let's say we want to print 5. Well, we want to print character 5 on the screen. So we, we add 5 there, we add into DL 48, so we print character 5, right? So now we're going to use the print character code, which is move into AH 2H, right? Then we have to end it with INT 21H, right? But let's start from the top. Now we moved into CX Five, right? So now CX has a value of five. We go down here. This is the code for print character. It's going to print character one on the screen, right? So now we're going to jump down here. It's going to print character two. It's going to print the character five on the screen, right? So now again, it gets to this loop point right here, right? Once it gets to this loop point, the first thing it does, it subtracts one 
from CX, right? Then it compares CX to zero. If CX does not equal zero, it's going to jump to whatever loop you have next to it. So it's going to jump to this part here, loop two, right? It's going to do this code again, which is print character five. So it's going to print character five again. Go back down to here. It's going to it's going to subtract one from CX, and it's going to compare CX from zero. If CX doesn't equal zero, it's going to again continue. Then um, then that's pretty much it for that part. So let's just hit run. Let's see what happens. So. Let's hit emulate, let's hit run. As you can see, it's just printing one, five, one, five, right? I'm gonna show you guys why it's continuing. Now, so let's go down here and let's move into CX, the value of five again. Let's see what happens. So again, let's start from the top. We, CX has a value of five right here. It goes down here, then it prints character one on the screen, right? So then it gets down here, it prints character five, then it gets to this loop instruction. Once it gets to this loop instruction, it's going to subtract one from CX and it's going to compare CX to zero. If, it, if not, it's going to keep going and going and going, right? So now when we get down here, we're going to move into CX5 again. So, the, so so it just keeps going. So we move into CX5, it gets down to here. It's going to subtract one from CX. So now it's going to be four, right? So now the loop is going to it's going to jump to label one, which is up here, and then it's going to continue. So let's hit emulate. Set run. As you can see, it's printing one five 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 one five five five. The loop is just keep going and going and going. Okay, the reason it's keep going is because CX is keep getting more and more value. So down here we gave CX another value of five. So it's gonna keep going. It's gonna keep repeating this pattern of one five 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 one five 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 one five 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 and so on and so forth. So how do we end the loop? The the way we end the loop is we have to use another register or another variable to store the information. I'm gonna show you guys how to do that right now. Now, when when working with nested loops, you should always have uh, you should have like a space holder. You should have a register or a variable that'll hold uh, the value of CX, so then you can keep moving them around when you need to. All right. So let's go up here. Let's uh, move into BX this time. The value of five. So now we have uh, the value of five in CX, and we have the value of five in BX above the loop code here, right? So. The reason why we're using two registers now is because when we get down to this point here, we actually want this whole loop and this whole program to end. Well, once the loop jumps back to this spot here, we'll uh, decrement, right? Decrement BX, right? Down up here. And down here, we'll uh, move into CX. BX and I'm gonna hit run and I'll let's delete this right here and I'm gonna explain what's happening. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit run. Now see it, the the program ended. I'll explain exactly what happened right now because it could get confusing. It, it gets really confusing in the beginning, but you have to just take it from piece by piece and just look at every little step. All right, we're gonna start from the top. We gave CX a value of five. We also gave BX a value of five, right? We know CX is the counter, right? BX is not a counter. We're using BX to, to end the second loop, basically. That's that's all we're doing. Now, guys, let's just start from the top. So I'll explain exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, we moved into CX value of five. So now CX has a value of five, right? We moved into BX a value of five. Now BX has a value of five. The reason we're doing that is because we need uh, BX to be able to end the second loop. It's like the placeholder for the CX for the second loop, right? You can use a variable, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just gonna use register BX. Again, from uh, we're gonna use uh, this, I'll explain what decrement BX means in a second, but we know that this is gonna print character one on the screen, right? This is the code to print character one on the screen. It's gonna get down to here. It's gonna print character five on the screen, right? Now we get to this loop instruction, right? We know the first thing it does, it subtracts one from CX, right? Then it compares CX to zero. If CX does not equal zero, it's going to go back to this spot, loop two, right? Because that's what the loop we added. It's gonna keep repeating that. It's gonna print five on the screen. It's gonna go down here. It's gonna decrement CX again. It's gonna keep doing that until CX is zero. Once CX is zero, it's gonna, we're gonna move down to here, right? Once we get down to here, we're gonna move BX into CX, right? We know BX had a value of five initially. <laughs> And the reason, and we're, we're moving BX into CX. So now, CX is the, is the counter. It has a value of five from here. It's gonna get to this loop point here. So again, the first thing it's gonna do is going to uh, 
decrement the CX by one, right? So now CX is going to have a value of four. It's going to compare uh, CX to zero. If CX is not zero, it's going to jump back to loop one here. Then it's going to decrement, see, see again, it's going to decrement BX up here and so on and so, so forth. So that's how the program ends, basically. You need another variable or register to as a placeholder to end the outer loop, basically. That's what, it's, what it's there for. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about the push and the pop instructions. So let's get started. Let me first start off by saying, normally when we uh, move a value from one area into memory, we have to specify the exact address. The program would have to specify the exact address in memory, right? Which takes up time, it slows down the CPU, and it's just really inefficient altogether. But uh, assembly programming, they figure it out a way around this. Now they figured out a neat technique, which they call push and pop. So you don't have to write those addresses. So let me show you exactly what push and pop do. Now, over here, I have a stack, right? This is a memory stack. Let's first talk about push. Push, when we use the push instruction, it stores the data on the top of the stack. It goes all the way on the top and it looks for the first uh, unused uh, memory address on the top of the stack, right? So it'll go all the way on top and look for the first empty spot, which would be this. Let's say I use the push instruction right now down here. Let's say I push AX, right? And let's say AX had the value of, let's say, one, two, three, four, space, one, two, three, four. I'm sorry, one, two, three, one, had the value of one, right? I, I, if, once I hit push AX, it's going to take this value, right? And it's automatically going to copy it to the first empty spot on the top of the stack. This would be the first empty spot on the top of the stack. So it would paste it here, right? So every time we push, it copies data on the top and it looks for the first empty spot. So the reason why this is more efficient, again, it, it, let's say when we're moving memory in a program, normally we have to specify exactly what that address and the size uh, and everything, and that, that takes up time. That's, that's more lines of programming you have to write, and it slows the, the program down. So ex that's why we use the push instruction. But now let's talk about the pop instruction. Now the pop uh, instruction retrieves data from the top of the stack. So let's say I used pop ax right now push ax it it'll, whatever value is in ax again was going is going to be saved in the first unused spot on the top of the stack let's say i pop cx now pop goes all the way on, on the top and it's going to look for the first uh, pushed or the last pushed spot so this would be the last push spot it takes this and it copies it right and and, and it'll copy it straight into cx so that's what pop does. Pop retrieves the data from the top of the stack, basically. So there's no need to specify exact addresses, and it's just really simple to do. If you want to just, you, it could be used as a placeholder, and it's really simple to do. So let, let me uh, demonstrate this in a program. Let's open up MU8086 here. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the AX register, for, and I want to give a value to the AX register. So I'm going to move into AX the value of one, right? So the AX register has a value of one. Now I'm going to pop, I'm sorry, now I'm going to push AX. Okay, again, AX has a value of one, right? Once we use the push instruction, AX, it's automatically gonna be copied to uh, somewhere on top of a memory stack that, that's empty. So let's say this would be the next, uh, we just use this one, right? So let's say this would be the next empty spot. It would copy that and, and paste it onto here. That's all, that's all it is. So let's go back to MU8086. So now let's say we pop now. We want to pop CX. And again, pop retrieves data from the top of the stack. So once we pop, it's going to uh, go, it's jump to the next spot that was used. It, the, the last uh, push point, basically, it copies that. And it stores it into the the destination, right? Which would be here, right? And now let's hit emulate. Let's hit the first. The first step we're gonna move into AX uh, value one, right? So the next step 
we're going to push AX. Again, well, once we push AX, again, it's going to copy it to the uh, top of the stack at the first unused spot. Now, let's go back to the program. Now, we can hit next step. Next step is going to pop CX, right? Once we, and once we hit next, it's going to pop CX. So, as you can see over here, CX now has a value of 1 because it pushed AX, right? AX had a value of 1. It pushed it on, on the top of the stack. Then once it got to this point here, once it popped CX, it went to the top of the stack and it copied the last spot that was pushed and it, and it copied it into CX. So that's why CX here now has a value of 1. So that's pretty much it. It's really simple. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the push F and pop F instruction. I'm also going to talk about the push FD and pop FD instruction. So let's get started. Let me first start off by explaining to you guys what push F and pop F do. Now let's say you, you wanted to um, save a backup of your flags, the state of your flags. We can't use the move instruction to move the flags into like, like into a variable or a register. There's no way to do it with, with the move instruction. The only way to save your uh, flags is to use the push F. What push F does, it, it basically uh, it uh, saves the, the state of your flags, the, the value of your flags, and it pushes it to the top of the data stack. Now, if you guys don't know about push and pop and how push and pop work, I've done a video on uh, push and pop, so check that out. Now, again, push F saves the, the state of your flags, and, it, and, it, and it'll, it'll push it to the top of the data stack, right? Now, we can use the pop then I use a variable name. Now let's create a variable name up here. I'm gonna call my variable save flags. You can name it whatever you want, right? I'm gonna make save flags equals to DW and I wanna make it have a value of this question mark meaning no value assigned yet. Now, again, push F saves the status of the flags, the state of the flags, whatever you wanna call it and it, and it pushes it to the top of the data stack. Now this pop instruction retrieves that and it'll save it into our variable which we named save flag. So let's type in our variable here. So again, push F, it uh, pushed the value of our flags to the top of the stack. Pop will we'll, uh, retrieve that data and save it into this variable. Now we, we have saved our flags, the status of our flags. Now they're all backed up. Now we can do the opposite. We, we can restore, restore them back to the way they were. To do that, we have to use first pop then the variable name, right? I'm sorry, first we have to use push, the regular push, then the variable name, which is S-A-V-E, flags, right? So now what this does, this is gonna take our variable, which has the backup of the flags. It's gonna push it back to the top of the data stack, right? Now we're gonna use the pop F. Now the pop F, it'll uh, grab whatever's in the top of that data stack, which was our a variable that had the backup, right? It'll grab it and it'll restore the flags to their to their original state. So that's how you restore the flags. So if you guys ever need to uh, back up the flags and then you want to restore it later on, this is the way we do it. Now, basically, there's another method. There's another way to do this. Let's say if you're working with 32-bit registers instead of 16, we use the push FD, and under here we'll use the pop FD, and this basically does the 32-bit version. It'll save the, the flags into a 32-bit uh, size. Then here you have to alter this up here, the size, and that's pretty much it. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about push AD, push A, pop AD, and pop A instructions. So let's get started. Let's first start off by talking about push A and pop A. Well push A, what push A does, it, it push A will move the value of all the 16-bit registers and move it to the top of the data stack, right? So, and it'll move it in this order. It'll start off with AX, then it'll go to CX, then it'll go to DX, then it'll go to BX, then it'll go to SP, then it'll go to BP, 
then it will go to SI, then it will go to DI, right? In this order, once you once the push A instruction is initiated, it starts first with AX, it will move AX to the nearest available spot in the top of the data stack, then it will move the value of CX to the top of the, of the data stack, then DX to the top, then BX, and so on and so forth, right? So let's delete that. What pop A does, it just retrieves the value of all the 16-bit registers from the top of the data stack and it restores them. So let me demonstrate how this works. Let's first start off by, I want to only uh, demonstrate by using three of the registers. I'm going to use AX, BX, and CX. So let's first move into AX, the value of 1. Let's move into BX, the value of 1 as well. Let's move into CX, the value of 1. Now, AX, BX, and CX, they all three have a value of 1, right? Let's use the push A instruction, right? Once the push A instruction is initiated, it's going to move the value of all the 16-bit registers to the top of the data stack, right? It'll copy them there. But before then, I'm going to move into AX, the value of 5. I'm going to move into C, I'm sorry, I'm going to move into BX, the value of 5, and I'm going to move into CX, the value of 5 as well. Now, what, what, what happens when we use the pop A? When we use the pop A, it will automatically overwrite whatever value after the push A and restore the registers with their initial value, right? It will retrieve the value from the top of the data stack and restore the registers. That's why I moved the value of 5 into all these three registers here. So to demonstrate how they will be overwritten later on. So let's start. Let's say emulate. Now over here, I'm going to hit uh, next step. The first step, we should move into AX the value of 1. So I'm going to hit single step here. As you can see, AX has a value of 1. Let's hit next step. And next step should move into BX the value of 1. We hit next step. BX has a value of 1. Let's hit next step. Now CX has a value of 1. All three of them have a value of 1. Go to next step, which is push A. Now push A, what push A again does, it pushes the value of all the CX registers to the top of the data stack, right? So now let's hit next. Now AX has a value of 5, because I gave it a value of 5 under here. Now let's hit next step. Now BX has a value of 5. Let's hit next step. Now CX has a value of 5. So now the next step is the pop A. It should retrieve the value uh, from the data stack and it should re and restore the values of the register. Let's hit next step. And it did. It restored the value of the registers. It, and now all three registers have a value of 1 again. So whenever every time you use the push A, whatever you do after the push A and, and, and before the pop A, it will get overwritten. Now let's talk about push AD and pop AD. Now push AD and pop AD do the exact same thing, but the only difference is it works with the 32-bit registers instead of the 16-bit registers. So if we use uh, push A and added a D, and pop A just add a D, it'll work with all of the 32-bit registers, and it'll work the, with the 32-bit registers in the same order. So instead of AX, this would be EAX, right? This would be EBX, ECX, and, and so on and so forth. Instead of the 16-bit registers, it'll do the same thing and just work with the 32-bit registers. Push AD and pop AD do the same thing as push A and pop A. Instead of uh, moving all the 16-bit registers to the top of the data stack, it, it'll move all the 32-bit registers to the top of the data stack. And that's pretty much it. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rustin from RossMertech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. In this class I'm going to talk about defining and using procedures. So let's get started. Now we, we've already used procedures before. This is the main procedure here. This is the startup procedure. Now we can create our own procedures. But uh, the main procedure is a little bit different. With the main procedure, we don't need to uh, have this RET to end the procedure. Since it is the main procedure and this is the startup procedure, it doesn't need that. Now, we can create our own procedures. We just have to first uh, give our procedure a name. I'll call mine uh, blue. And um, hit space, then we type in PROC, like the main procedure. Hit enter a few times, then we have to type in RET. Then we hit enter, then we hit backspace a few times, then we type in our procedure name, which is blue, then end. 
and P for end procedure, right? So since we created a new procedure, we have to have this RET before the uh, blue end P or before the pr procedure name end P or else it won't work. With the main procedure, you don't need to have this RET because this is a startup procedure. Now, let's talk about what procedures are. If you guys are using object-oriented programming languages like Java or C++, uh, they're, they're either called methods or functions, right? They're basically a subroutine within the program, a little program within the program that, uh, that'll help you do certain things. Now, these things, these procedures, they have limitations. Like, let's say you want to c jump from one procedure to the other. Like, you have a label here. Let's, let's say you declared a label, which you called green, right? up here technically you can't use the jump instruction from one label to the other let's say I have JMP here and our label name which is green technically it, it, it won't jump because it's a different procedure now th there's a way around it you can declare your label a global label and the way you do that is by having two colons instead of one next to the label name when you declare it. So now this is a global label and you can jump from anywhere in the program. But if you guys are using procedures, it's highly, highly recommended that you don't uh, jump from one procedure to the other or loop from one procedure to the other because you can mess up the runtime stack and it will be corrupted and your program will not work. So it's highly recommended you don't jump or loop from one procedure to the other. So yeah, that's how, that's how procedures pretty much work you can you can just cr create a procedure name you can put the procedure in anywhere in the program and it works like a miniature program and it does its own and each uh, let's say you have a really complicated program most complicated programs in assembly they have a lot of little procedures within them each procedure has its own task and it, and it just keeps things very organized and, and, and easy to understand and, uh, and you won't have as much errors as you would just by having one procedure. All right, guys, now I'm going to show you guys how to use the procedures and how to call them. We, we uh, call a procedure by using the call instruction. We return the value of a procedure by using the RET instruction. But let me just show you how that works. Let's delete this here and let's delete this jump here. So now uh, we have two procedures again. We have the main and we have the blue, right? Now how do, how do I uh, call the blue from the main? I'll show you guys how to do it. First, let's, let me move around some values. Let's move into AX, the value of one, right? So when the program first starts, it's gonna move into AX value of one. Now I'm gonna use the call instruction, which is C-A-L-L, -L, then hit space, then we have to type in our procedure name, which is blue, right? So we're calling blue. So what's going to happen is the program's going to start, right? We're in the main method. It's going to execute this line of code, which is moving to AX value one. AX is going to have a value one. It's going to go down to this next line of code, which is going to call the blue method. It's going to jump to the blue method, execute whatever's in the blue method. Then it's going to hit this return instruction. Then it's going to return back to the main method, but under uh, the call uh, instruction. So let, let's write something under the call instruction. Let's move into AX, let's say the value of three, right? So let's uh, let's move around some values in the blue procedure here. Let's move into AX, uh, let's say four, right? Move into BBX four. So we move into AX1, we moved into, let's say BX1 again. So let's change this to a BX instead of an AX. So let's make, make this a one. So again, from the top, the program is gonna start, it's gonna give AX a value of one. Then it's gonna move down to this call instruction, it's gonna call the blue method. So we're gonna jump, this is not a jump, but it's gonna move to wherever the, the the blue procedure is, then it's going to start the code within the blue procedure. It's going to execute the code, so then it's going to it's going to move into AX the value of four, then it's going to move into BX the value of four. It's going to get to this RET instruction for return. All right, what the RET instruction does, it just goes back to uh, the procedure you are in where you use the call, and it'll start the, the line of code underneath the call. So it'll then it will move into BX the value of one. So let's just test it out. So I'm going to hit emulate. Now I'm going to hit next step. The first step, we know that uh, we moved into AX the value of one, right? 
So let's hit next step. Our next step is actually the call blues. So let's hit next. Now, as you can see here, let's just maximize this here. As you can see here, it jumped straight to the blue uh, procedure, right? Now it's at the first line of code. So let's hit next step. Now it, it executed the first line of code in the blue procedure. Now our AX has a value of four. Now let's hit next step. Now it did the second line of code in the blue procedure. Now our BX has a value of four. Now we're at the point where it's going to return back to the main uh, procedure, right? So RET is the return instruction. So let's hit next step. And as you can see from up here, it returned back to the main procedure. It started under the call instruction here. So now it's, it's going to execute move BX1. So now let's hit next step. It moved into BX the value one. Now, now, now it's going to go to the first line of the blue procedure again, just because that's the, the way that the program falls. So let's hit next step. AX has a value of four because we moved into AX the value of four. Hit next step. BX has a value of four because we moved into BX four. Let's hit next step and it should end the program there. So again, when we call a uh, procedure, it, it goes to, to that procedure, it executes whatever is in that procedure, as many lines of code that it is. Once it gets to this RET instruction, it'll go back to the original procedure right under the call instruction. So it'll execute whatever is under the call instruction. Then it, the program will continue normally. So then it'll, it'll, it'll work normally and just go to next line, next line, execute the next line, execute the next line. So yeah, that's how uh, procedures work. That's how we can call procedures and that's how this RET instruction works. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissim from RossMertech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from rossmertech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about nested procedure calls. So let's get started. A nested procedure calls occurs when a called procedure calls another procedure before the first procedure returns. It's a tongue twister, right? So let me explain to you exactly how that works. So here we know this is our main procedure, right? This is the first procedure. Now let's say we had more than one procedure. Let me create a couple. The first one I'm going to call sub1, right? I'm gonna hit RAT for return, and we have to end sub one, so sub one and P right for end procedure. Let's make another procedure. Let's call this one sub two. Then we have to type in PROC, hit enter. We have to type in RET. Actually, we're not gonna type in RET in this one. We're just going to um, end this procedure. So let's uh, type in the procedure name, which is sub two. Then hit space and P for end procedure, right? So here we have three procedures now. We have the main procedure here, we have sub one, and we have sub two, right? So let's let's give sub one a value first. Let's let's say we were to call sub one from the main procedure, right? So let's type another instruction underneath this. Let's uh, move into AX. The reason I did that is because uh, we need somewhere for the R return instruction to go because the return re instruction goes underneath the last call. So it, it would need somewhere to go. So that's why I moved into AX to value one. So under here, let's say we call sub two, right? And let's fix this up a little bit. And in sub two, let's just type in RET return right so this is the way this is going to happen up here we have the main procedure we're calling sub one right so it's automatically going to go to sub one it's going to do the first instruction in sub one which is another call instruction so now we're calling sub two so it's going to go directly to sub two and sub two there is no instruction there's only the return instruction so it, it when we use the return instruction it goes backwards right it will return back to the previous call right under the call instruction so right under the call instruction there's another return instruction right so that's going to go back to the main procedure and uh, right under the call uh, instruction in the main procedure under the call instruction in the main procedure is moving to ax the value of one right so basically what this does is uh, it, it keeps going to another procedure before it'll, it'll let the return function initiate 
So what this does, it, all, it starts, then it goes backwards. So the, this type of programs are used when uh, you want to retrace your steps, when the program needs to retrace the steps. So this is a perfect program for that. All right, so up here, let me, right, this should be a, a main, not end. All right, let's hit emulate. So let's, uh, let's hit first step. Now, we have this call sub one instruction highlighted first because it's the first instruction here, right? So once I hit next step, it should go uh, to uh, sub one, right? So let's hit next step. Now we're in sub one, right? Now we're highlighting the call sub two instruction. Once I hit next step, it's gonna go to sub two, right? So let's hit next step. We're highlighting the return instruction, right? Once I hit next step, it should return back to sub one, right? So let's hit next step. It returned back to the sub one under the, the call instruction, which is another return instruction, so we should go back to main, right? So let's hit next step. We're back in main under the call instruction. Now we're highlighting a move into AX value one. Once I hit next step, the, the AX should have a value of one. Now let's hit next step. Now, as you can see over here, the AX has a value of one. Again, nested procedures are used for when a program needs to retrace its step. So it's perfect for that. It'll start and it'll go back backwards. So it's basically retracing its step. All right, guys, let me go over that one more time. So let me hit emulate right here. The program starts, right? Uh, the first call is highlighted. So call to sub one is highlighted. When we hit next step, it's going to go to uh, whatever is in sub one, the first line of instruction of sub one, right? So next step, we went to sub one and it highlighted the first line of instruction, which is another call instruction. So once I hit next step, all right, it should go to sub two and it should highlight the first instruction in sub two. So let me hit next step. All right, we're in sub two now. And it's highlighting the return instruction, right? So once I hit next step, we're going to initiate the return instruction. The return instruction goes back to the previous uh, method where the call was initiated and it'll highlight the instruction underneath the call, right? So let's hit next step. We're in the previous uh, procedure, which is sub one, and we're at the instruction underneath the call, which, and underneath the call, we have another return instruction. So once I hit next step, it should go back to main. So let's hit next step. Now we're in the main procedure again, and uh, we're highlighting the instruction under the call, right? So move into AX, the value one is the instruction under the call. So once we hit next step, uh, AX should have a value of one. Next step. Now, as you can see over here, AX has a value of one. Again, it's not that hard to do. All, all we're doing is um, in, in, instead of uh, returning a value right back to the, to, uh, the procedure, it, it, the first instruction is a call. So it'll keep calling and keep moving to the next procedure then it'll go backwards and it will retrace the steps. So basically th that's what this program does. Pretty much it for this uh, class. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm gonna talk about the AND instruction. So let's get started. Now the AND instruction performs a Boolean bitwise AND operation between each pair of matching bits in two operands and places the result in a destination operand. Let me show you how that works. Now up here, this is a syntax of the AND operation. We start off by typing AND first, hit space. We type in our destination operand, hit comma, then we hit space and we type in our source operand. You guys want to make sure both operands are the same size. This is very important. Now, if you're working with an 8-bit operand, both operands have to be 8 bits. If you're working with a 16-bit value, both operands have to be 16 bits, and so on and so forth. Now, this is the different combinations of the AND operation here. Now, we can AND one register to another register, right? But both registers, again, have to be the same size. We can end a register into memory. But again, both registers and memory have to be the same size. We can end re registers into immediate values. Again, both the register and immediate value have to be the same size. We can end memory into a register. Again, both memory and register have to be the same size. And we can end memory into immediate value. Again, immediate value and memory have to be the same size. Now, let me show you how... Uh, the AND operation works. Now, it starts out by comparing two bits, right? It's the, the source operand and the destination operand. If both bits are zero, the result will be a zero. If one bit is zero and one bit is one, 
the result would be zero. If the first operand is one and the second operand is zero, the result would be zero. The only time you'll ever get a one as a result is if both operands have a one bit. So then two one bits will give you a one, otherwise everything else is zero. So let me just give you guys an example of that right now. Let's say we had zero, 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 that's four, five, six, let's make another zero then a one, right? This is an eight bit operand here. 8-bit boolean value and uh, it has a value of 1, right? Now let's say we're anding another 8-bit uh, boolean value down here. Let's say we let's type in 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, let's make this a 1, 0, 1, right? Now the result of this here, let's go back. Now two zeros again make a 0, right? Two zeros make a 0, two zeros make a 0, two zeros make a 0, two zeros make a 0. One zero and one uh, one make a zero. Two zeros make a zero. Now, when we get to a point where there are two one bits, then that's the only time you, the result will have a one. So when you end this with this, you get this one. So here, this is uh, th this has a value of one, right? This boolean value is a value of one here. Over here, this boolean value has a value of, let's say, 1. This is the second bit. This is the third bit, which is a 4. So 4 and 1 is 5, right? So this has a value of 5. This, And then when you add 5 and 1, you get a 1. Pretty neat, right? All right, let's open up MU8086, right? Let's first start off by moving some values in some 8-bit registers. So let's move into, let's say, AH, a boolean value of 0, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, right? That's an 8 bit value. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and this is a 1 in, in binary, right? So now let's move into, let's say, BH, because BH is another 8 bit register. Let's move 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Oh, let's make this a 1, 0, 0, 1. Actually, let's use the same example that we used before. Let's make this a zero and let's make this a one, right? So now we know this is one, we know this is five in binary, right? But when we end the two together, we should get the result of a one. So let's and AH, because AH is going to be the destination operand. So AH is going to store the and uh, results. Use a comma, then we want to end it with BH, right? So let's hit emulate. Now, first step here, we're going to move into AH, the binary. Oops, you know what I forgot to do? Let's close this here. I forgot to add B to, at the end of this 8-bit uh, binary value here because uh, we, that lets the program know that this is a binary uh, value. And uh, we have to do the same thing with this one here. So when you're working with binary values, you make sure you use a B at the end. If you're working with hexadecimals, you make sure you use the H and so on and so forth. Let's hit emulate. Our first step here is going to move a binary value of 1 into AH, right? So let's hit next step. As you can see, AH over here has a value of 1. Now the second step should move a value of 5 into BH, right? So let's hit next step. BH here has a value of 5, right? Now we're highlighting the AND operation over here. Once, once I hit next step, it's going to AND the AH and BH, and it's going to store the results in AH because AH is the destination operand, remember? So let's hit next step, and as you can see, AH here has a value of 1 because when we ended it to uh, the result was 1. Let's let's go over what we did. See here 0 and 0 make a 0, right? 0 and 0 make a 0, 0 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 1 make a 0, 0 0 make a 0, 1 and 1 make a 1. So the result would be a 1 when you end both operands. All right, guys, that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from rosmertech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from rosmartech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the OR instruction, so let's get started. Now the OR instruction performs a boolean OR operation between each pair of matching bits in two operands and places the result in a destination operand. So let me give you guys an example of that right now. Now here, this is a syntax of a OR operation. It's similar to AND, but that's as far as the similarities go. Now, we start off by typing OR, hit space, then we type in our destination operand. Then use a comma afterwards. Then we hit space and then we type in our source operand. So that's the syntax of a OR instruction. Now let's go down here and this is the different combinations of the OR instruction. We can OR 
our register into a register. We can or memory into our register. We can or immediate value into a register. We can or a register into memory, or we can or immediate value into memory. The one thing you guys have to make sure you do is make sure both operands are the same size. Both operands either have to be 8 bits, 16 bit, 32 bit, or whatever. So they can't be different sizes, they must be the same size, very important. Then here I'm going to give you an example of how the OR operation actually works. This is where the OR operation becomes completely different from the AND. The only similarity is when uh, you have two zero bits. If you have two zero bits, then the result is a one, right? If you have here a zero and a one, the result is always going to be a one. If you have a one and a zero, the result will be a one. If you have two ones, the result will be a one. Now. The result will always be a one as long as there's a one. Otherwise, if there are two zeros, that's the only case when you'll ever get a zero. All right, so that's how this works. Then this actually, this is an and symbol. The or symbol is inverted. I don't know how to get that inverted symbol there, but it's it's the opposite way of uh, the end. So let's just type in or. So, okay, now let's open up MU8086, right? Now I'll have MU8086 here. Now let me give you a demonstration of how the OR operation works. Let's first start off by moving some values and we're going to use 8-bit values here. And we're going to use 8-bit registers. So um, let's move into AH because AH is an 8-bit register. And let's move a Boolean value of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. We know this is a Boolean value. And after you type in a Boolean value, you have to make sure you type in a B because that, that'll let the program know that this is a Boolean value. Now we know this is a 4, right? This is Boolean 4. Now let's move into BH, another, a Boolean value. So BH, let's type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 1, right? And then we have to make sure we type in B. We know this is a 3, right? So now let's OR this. OR is our instruction, right? Hit space. We have to type in a destination operand. I'm going to use AH as our destination operand. Use a comma, hit space again. Now we have to type in our source operand, which is BH, right? And let's hit emulate. All right, the first step here is highlighted. Move into AH this Boolean value, which is 4. So once I hit next step or single step, AH should have a value of 4. Let's hit single step. Now, as you can see over here, AH has now a value of four. Now it's highlighting our second step here. Our second step is moving to BH, this Boolean value, which is a Boolean value of three. So let's hit single step. Now, as you can see over here, BH has now a value of three. Now it's highlighting the OR instruction. Now, once I hit single step, the results of AH, which is the destination operand, it should be a seven, right? So let's hit single step. And as you can see now, AH has a value of seven. And I'm gonna write the result underneath this here. So it's zero, 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 one, 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 right? We know that's the result. That's a binary uh, value of seven, right? All right, guys, so that's pretty much it. If you like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the XOR instruction, so let's get started. The XOR instruction performs a Boolean exclusive OR operation between each pair of matching bits in two operands and stores the results in a destination operand. So let me show you guys exactly what that means. This is a syntax of a XOR instruction here. We first start off by typing XOR, hit space. We type in our destination operand, comma, hit space again, then we type in our source operand. So again, this is the, the syntax of the XOR operation. There are two operands here, it will get XORed, and, it'll, and it'll, the results will get stored in this destination operand. Now down here, this is how an XOR operation actually works. When comparing two bits, if both bits are zero, the results will be a zero. If one bit is zero and one bit is one, the result will be a one. If one bit is one and one bit is zero, the result will be a one. If both bits are one, the result will be a zero. The way this works, two matching bits, whether it's zero or one, will give you a zero. Otherwise, everything else is a one. So let me show you an example of that right down here. Let's use a 8-bit uh, binary uh, value down here. Let's type in eight ones. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We know this is two, five, five. This is the decimal of 255, right? And the hexadecimal of FF. How do I know that? Let's just copy it here. 
I have a neat tool that I use and I'm gonna open up my browser this is a uh, binary to decimal to hexadecimal converter uh, you can find this at mathisfun.com I'll leave a link in my description I have to what, what did I copy I copied okay I copied the binary now all you have to do is paste whatever value you're trying to convert right and just hit enter and it'll convert it and it'll show you uh, the, the differences in decimal hexadecimal and binary so our 8-bit value of eight ones has a decimal value of 255 right and a hexadecimal of FF so let's try another one down here let's let's XOR it to another 8-bit uh, binary value let's uh, this time have let's this time use seven ones right one two three four five six seven and one zero so this I know has a value of two five four and a hexadecimal value of F E so we're gonna test it out right now I'm gonna copy this binary value here we're gonna open up our browser again I'm gonna paste it on top of here and I'm gonna hit enter and as you can see it has a decimal value of five four and a hexadecimal value of F E pretty cool right now let's XOR it down here okay matching pairs will give you a zero right so zero 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 now finally we don't have a matching pair because the first bit is one and the second bit is zero so that'll give you a one right so the results of this binary value XOR to this binary value will give you a one a decimal value of one so let's test it out. Let's open up MU8086, right? We have to start off by moving around some values first. All right, we have to type in end P to end this uh, procedure here. So let's just clean this up a little bit. And we got to move some values around. I'm going to use a 8-bit value, so we got to work with 8-bit registers. So let's move into AH. Our first value we used, uh, and that's eight ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We know this has a decimal value of two five five and a hexadecimal value of FF, right? So let's also move into BH, because this is another eight bit register. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero, right? So we know this has a value of two five four and a hexadecimal value of F. E, right again when working with binary values right when, oh, you have to make sure you type at the end of the binary value B so the program knows this is a binary value so now let's use the XOR instruction we have to type in X O R hit space we have to type in our destination operand. and I'm gonna make a H our destination operand right comma space and now our source operand which is BH right so these two uh, binary values are going to XOR and the results will be stored in AH, right? So let's hit emulate. Our first step here is highlighted, move into AH, this value here. This value should have a binary value of, of 255 and a hexadecimal value of FF. So let's hit next step and see what happens. See, over here, AH has a hexadecimal value of FF or a decimal value of 255. Now our second step is highlighted, move into BH, uh, one 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 zero one. I'm sorry. One 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 zero. This has a decimal value of two five four and a hexadecimal value of FE. Let's hit single step, and as you can see, our BH register now has a value of FE. Now our last step here is highlighted, right? Our XOR instruction, and uh, we're XORing this binary value with this binary value and the results should be stored in AH. So let's hit next step, and the results were stored in AH here. Now AH has a value of one, because this binary value here, XORed with this binary value, will give you a value of one. And let me just demonstrate that again. Let's close this here. Let's uh, hit enter. Okay, we know, again, two matching bits will give you a one. I'm sorry, two matching bits will give you a zero. Zero again, zero, 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 zero. Now we come to the end and uh, we have one and we have a zero, so that's a one. So these two X ord gave me a value of one. And that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissin from RossBurtech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rissin from RossBurtech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about the NOT instruction, so let's get started. Now the NOT instruction is really simple to do, so this is going to be a quick tutorial. 
So the non-instruction, basically what the non-instruction does, it inverts the bits of a operand. So ones will be zeros and zeros will be ones. So, so I'll give you an example of that right here. Let's say you want a not a 8-bit uh, binary value. And this is the binary value. Let's say it's 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Then four ones, one, two, three, four. So when you use the non-instruction, and, you, and this is the, the value that you're using the non instruction on, the results would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. All 1s would be zeros and one, zeros would be 1s, basically. It just inverts it. So l let me show you the syntax of a not instruction. We start off by typing not, then our operand, which if it's a register or memory, it doesn't matter. But first, let's move some values around. Let's move into ah, because ah is a. 8-bit register and we're going to use an 8-bit binary value. Let's move into AH. This binary value of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, right? This is an 8-bit value. So let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Since this is a binary value, we have to make sure we type B at the end of this so the computer knows that it's a binary value. So now let's use the NOT instruction. So this is the syntax of a NOT instruction. We type in NOT. Then our operand, our, in this case our operand is AH. So again, all the non instruction does is it inverts the bits of a operand. So ones will be zeros and zeros will be ones. So let's hit emulate, right? We're moving into AH, uh, this va our binary value here. It's highlighted, so net single step. So now the non instruction is highlighted and our operand is AH. Let's hit single step again. Now our AH register has a hexadecimal value of 81. Let's find out what 81 is. Let's open up our browser, and here I have a binary to decimal, so hexadecimal converter. Uh, this is from mathisfun.com. I'm going to leave a link to this in my description if you guys want to use it. So all you have to do is copy and paste it to where it applies, and it'll convert it throughout. So now let's paste it here on hexadecimal, then hit enter. Our hexadecimal value of 81 is this binary value here. So let's make sure that this is our binary value inverted, right? Let's just copy this here and let's paste it on our code here. So as you can see, this is just the inverted version of the, our binary value and that's all the not instruction does. So pretty simple, right? So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my <laughs> channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the test instruction, so let's get started. Now what is the test instruction? Well the test instruction is basically the, exactly the same as the AND instruction, the only difference is the test instruction does not affect the destination operand, and I'll explain to you exactly what I'm talking about. The test instruction is really only used to test whether or not bits are one or not one and I'll and I'll show you right now let's start off by uh, moving around some values let's move into AH because AH is a 8-bit register and I'm going to use a 8-bit a binary value let's move into AH a 8-bit binary value of 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 right let's make sure this is 8 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 right since it's a binary value we have to type in B at the end so the computer knows it's a binary value now again, we move this to AH, this binary value here, which is a value of 1. So now let's use the test instruction. We have to start off by typing in test. Test is the instruction. And uh, hit space. Now we're going to type in our destination operand, which is AH. Use a comma. Now, we know that AH has this binary value here right now because we moved this into AH, right? So now we got to give it another binary value to test against, right? So let's let's give it the same value. So let's just type in 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, B, right? And it's going to test against AH, so it's the same value. So it's going to basically AND both uh, operands, right? And uh, we know when you AND an uh, operand, two bits have to be both 1 for the result to be a 1, otherwise everything else is 0, right? So 1 and 1 will be a 1, the rest will be a 0. If 1 was 1 and 1 was 0, it would still be a 0. So again, once, once we uh, hit emulate, the destination operand is not affected. It's only used for testing purposes. And the way that uh, the test works 
it's it, it uh, it'll change the, the flags mainly the zero flag right so if the zero flag is one that means the results are all one and that means the bit you're testing does not have a pair of matching bits basically no bits are matching at all so if the if the zero flag is uh, zero that means there, there, there are matching bits so let's test it out right now let's hit emulate Right now it's highlighting our move into AH, this binary value. Let's hit single step. Now our AH register has a value of one, right? So now it's highlighting this test uh, instruction here, right? Let's hit next step. Now our AH value still has a value of one because remember I told you it does not affect the destination operand at all. It's only used for testing purposes. Now again, the, the, the way we uh, test is by uh, observing the flags and let me open the flags here. Right now, our zero flag is set to zero. The, the reason it's set to zero is because we have a pair of matching ones, right? And uh, the result then will be a one. So, we, so then we know that uh, the, there are a pair of matching ones because we had a result of one. Otherwise, the result will be a zero. And that's why the zero flag is set to zero, right? So now let's change this. Let's close this here, right? Let's make this a zero instead. So the result will be all zero. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit single step and open up our flags. Let's hit single step again. And uh, as you can see, our zero flag is set to one because the result is zero and there were no pairs of matching ones. That's pretty much it. The only reason to ever use the test instruction is to test whether or not uh, bits in a specific operand are have ones or, or not. That's the only reason. Otherwise, you'll never use it. But that, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed this tutorial, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about the compare instruction. So let's get started. Now what is the compare instruction? The compare instruction performs a implied subtraction of the source operand from the destination operand. Neither the source or the destination operand are affected. So let's open this up here. So this is the syntax of a compare instruction here. We start off by typing in CMP, hit space. We type in our destination operand, comma, hit space again, then we type in our source operand. Now, the, the way this works, the source operand is subtracted from the destination operand, and only the flags are affected. All right, we only really use the compare instruction only with conditional jumps. When combined together, they make the assembly programming language equivalent of an if statement. So I'm going to talk more about conditional jumps in my next class, but these are how the flags are affected right here. If our destination operand is less than our source operand, the zero flag is zero and the carry flag is one. If our destination operand has a greater value than our source operand, then both uh, the zero flag and carry flag have a value of zero. If our destination operand is equal to our source operand and then our zero flag would be one and our carry flag would be zero. All right, so let me show you how that works in uh, MU8086. So I'm gonna open that up right now. Let's start off by moving around some values. Let's move into AX, because AX is a 16-bit register and I wanna use some 16-bit values. Let's move into AX, the value of 500, right? So now let's move into BX the value of, let's say, 200, right? So now we moved into AX, the value of 500. We moved into BX, the value of 200. Now let's use the compare instruction. We start off by typing in CMP, because this is the compare instruction, hit space. We have to give it a destination operand. I'm gonna use AX as our destination operand. We're gonna type in comma, hit space. Now we're gonna type in our source operand, which is BX, right? So now AX has a value of 500, BX has a value of 200. Now AX, has a greater value than BXR. So if our destination operand has a greater value than our source operand, both the, the zero flag and the carry flag would be set to zero. So let's test it out. I'm gonna hit emulate. Let's hit single step. So, so we're moving into AX, the value of 500. Now the second line of code is highlighted. We're moving to BX, the value of 200. So let's hit single step again. Now BX has a value of 200. Now our compare instruction is highlighted. So once I hit next step, the flags will be altered. So let's hit single steps. So right here, as you can see, our destination operand and our source operand are not affected. The value is exactly the same. The only thing that is affected is these flags here. So 
our carry flag here is set to zero and our zero flag is set to zero because the destination operand had a greater value than the source operand. Let's test something out. Let's turn this around. Let's make this 200. Let's close this first. Let's make AX have a value of 200 and let's give BX a value of 500. We changed that around. Now our destination operand has a smaller uh, value than our source operand. So let's find out what happens. So if our destination value has a lesser value than our source operand, the zero flag should be set to zero and the carry flag should be set to one. Let's find out. Let's hit emulate. All right, so our first line of code is highlighting. We're moving into AX, the value of 200. Let's hit single step. Now AX has a value of 200 here. Now the second line of code is highlighted. Move into BX, the value of 500. So let's hit single step. Now BX here has a value of 500. Once I hit single step, neither of the AX or BX are gonna be altered at all. Only the flags will be altered. So let me just open up the flags here. So our compare instruction here is highlighted. Once I hit single step, the the flags will be altered. So let's hit single step. And now as you can see, the flags are altered here. So again, our destination operand has a smaller value than our uh, source operand over here. So let's open this up again. Our destination val value, if it has a smaller value than our our source operand, then the zero flag will be set to zero and the carry flag will be set to one. Let's find out. Our carry flag is set to one and our zero flag is set to zero. Pretty cool, right? So let's close this up here. Let's try something else. Let's make them both equal to each other. So the zero flag is set. So let's make this one 500. Now both AX and BX have a value of 500. So when they compare, they're going to subtract each other. And then it, the, the result will be a zero. So then the zero flag will be set to one and the carry flag will be set to zero. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit single step. Now our AX has a value of 500. Let's hit single step again. Now BX has a value of 500. Now our compare instruction is highlighted here. Again, only our flags will be altered. So let's hit single step. Our flags are altered. Again, the carry flag has a value of zero and the Zero flag has a value of one because they're equal to each other and the result was zero since they subtract each other. Cool, right? Again, we only use the compare instruction only with conditional jumps because uh, the two combined create a assembly programming language equivalent of a if statement. So that's the only reason we'll ever use them. But that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rustin from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about conditional jumps, so let's get started. Now what are conditional jumps? Well conditional jumps are just jumps that only will jump if a certain condition is met. And uh, they uh, look at the registers. If a certain register is uh, meets their condition then they'll jump. We use the conditional jumps together with the comparison instruction. With the comparison instruction, CMP, uh, we can compare operands. Now, uh, then the, the flags are affected. The two operands are not affected. So the only thing affected are flags. So then the jump instruction, the conditional jump instruction looks at the flags. If the certain flag is, if the certain condition is met, then the jump happens. If not, then it, it, the program continues normally. So these are some of the conditional jump instructions. There are more. I'm going to talk more about those conditional jumps in the next class but uh, we're gonna we're gonna work on these today so the first one is JC jump if carry so basically if the carry flag is set to one then uh, you will jump then uh, next one is JNC jump if not carry so if the carry flag is not set if the carry flag is clear then you will jump the next one is JZ this is the one that most people use JZ is jump if zero. So the, if the zero flag is set, then the jump happens. The next one is JNZ, jump if not zero. So if the zero flag is not set and the zero flag is clear, then you will jump. So again, we use the jump instructions with together with the comparison instruction, right? And uh, the comparison instruction compares operands. If then uh, the operands are not affected, but the flags are affected, then the jump instruction looks at the flag. If that, that certain flag that it's looking at is uh, set, then the jump happens. If it's not set, then it won't happen. So I'll show you how that works right now. So we have to start off by moving around some values. Let's move into AX, the value of five, right? And now AX has a value of five. Let's use the CMP instruction to compare instruction. So CMP, 
and uh, we want to compare whether AX has a value of 5, right? So AX 5, right? So what, what this is going to do, it's going to uh, subtract 5 from AX and uh, it's not going to affect the operands, right? And uh, the only th the thing that's going to be affected is the flags. So it's going to subtract those two and uh, the flags are affected, right? Once it subtracts the two, it should be a zero. The zero flag should be set because we moved into AX the value of five, right? Then when we compared a five with AX, they're gonna subtract, then we're gonna get a zero, so then the zero flag should be set. So then let's use the jump if zero. So JZ, sorry, JZ is jump if zero, right? And let's create a label to jump to, let's say L2, right? Let me create the label down here. So L2, and we gotta use colon, right? So this is our label. This is the, the, the spot it's going to jump. It'll jump right under here and execute whatever instruction is under the label. So, right, we, we typed in L2. Now let's uh, add some code under L2 here. Let's move into AX. I'm sorry, let's use BX. Let's move, let's say, 6, right? So let's move some values in between here. So move into, let's say, BX say one right so okay I'll explain exactly what's going on we started off by moving uh, the value of 5 into AX right so now AX has a value of 5 okay, now we use the comparison instruction right we're comparing the value of 5 with AX AX has a value of 5 so they're gonna subtract each other right the comparison operator subtracts the the both values it doesn't alter the values it just subtracts them and then if it affects the flags and uh, since 5 to minus 5 is 0, right, they're equal to each other, the 0 flag will be set. So now here we have uh, the conditional jump here. This is jump if 0. So this will jump only if the 0 flag is set. So the 0 flag is set here. So then it will jump to our label L2. And then it will start the code here. So then it should move into BX6. And it should uh, bypass this here, right, so move into BX1. Let's test it out. That's it. It's highlighting our first instruction, move into AX the value of 5, right? Once I hit single step, AX should have a value of 5. So let's hit single step. As you can see, AX has a value of 5 up here. Let me just move this up here. As you can see, AX has a value of 5. Now it's highlighting our second instruction, the comparison instruction, right? Once I hit single step, the comparison instruction is not going to alter the values at all. It's just going to affect the flags right here. So I'll move the flags up here. So right now the flags are 0, right? So once I hit single step, the flag should be altered, right? So let's open this up here. So our zero flag is set because uh, the, the two values were the same and the comparison operator subtracts the values and, and now we have a zero and the zero flag is set. So now here it's, it's highlighting jump if zero. So this will jump to our label only if the zero flag is set. In our case, the zero flag is set, so it should jump straight to here. Let's hit single step. As you can see, it jumped right under the, the L2 label because that we put the L2 label next to our jump. So it completely bypassed this, right? What the, the, the conditional jumps do, they're like the equivalent of an if statement, basically. And you're testing conditions. If certain conditions are met, then you do something. Otherwise, you, you do something else, right? So let's try something else, right? Let's close this here. Let's try another conditional jump instruction. Let's try jump if uh, zero flag is not set. So that's JNZ. Let's open up MU8086. Let's type in JNZ, right? So right here, we're going to leave our values the same. So th the zero flag will be set, so it won't jump straight to L2. It will uh, first execute this, then it'll go to L2, right? So let's hit emulate. First line of code is highlighted, so let's hit single step. Now our AX has a value of 5. The comparison instruction is highlighted, right? So let me open up the flags here so you can see. So once I hit single step, nothing will be affected other than the flags. Let's hit single step here and there's again the zero flag is set because we didn't alter the values at all right so right now our uh, conditional jump is highlighted right here is jump if the zero flag is not set right so it's not going to jump it should uh, move straight to this here because the zero flag is set so let's hit single step and as, as you can see we removed right under it did not jump to our label here because the zero flag was set and this uh, conditional jump would only jump if the zero flag was not set. So pretty cool, right? Let's try another one. Let's try jump if carry, JC. The carry flag can be set if when using the 
comparison instruction and if the result is not equal then the, the carry flag is set so let's so uh, this conditional jump here is JC so let's try it out so let's jump if the carry flag is set so let's type in C so JC jump if carry flag is set leave these two values the same the carry flag won't be set so let's make this one a four since the, the answer is not going to be equal we, the, the carry flag will be set so let's hit emulate our first line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of 4, let's hit single step. Next line of code is highlighted, the comparison operator, right? Let's hit single step. And our flags are affected here. See the carry flag was set to 1 because they were not equal, right? And the, the zero flag wasn't set, so the carry flag was set. So now right here, our conditional jump is highlighted, jump if carry flag is set. So it's going to jump to our label because the carry flag is set. So let's hit single step. As you can see, it bypassed this here and jumped straight to our label. And now let's hit single step. Now it moved into BX the value of 6 and completely skipped this here. Let's try another one. Let's try jump if not carry. So J and C. If the jump if not if the carry flag is not set. So it's basically like the jump if zero. So let's make this five again. And uh, let's make this jump if not carry. So, so add an N between here. J and C is the instruction. So basically this will jump only if the, the, the carry flag is not set. So let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted. Move into AX the value of 5. Let's hit single step. Now AX has a value of 5. Our second line of code is highlighted. The comparison instruction, right? So again, the flags are only affected. The, the values are not affected at all. So let's uh, hit single step. As you can see, our carry flag is zero, right? Because our carry flag was not set, so it should jump, right? So let's hit single step, and it jumped because the carry flag was not set. So that's pretty much it. So again, this is going to be part one of conditional jumps. Our next uh, part, I'll be talking about equality comparison and the equality uh, jump instructions so right, if you guys like this video please give me a like if you want more videos like this please subscribe to my channel i'm Rasim from rossmurtech.com and thanks for watching what's up guys i'm Rasim from rossmurtech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming now in this class i'm going to talk about conditional jumps based on equality so let's get started now what are conditional jumps based on equality if you guys watched my last class on conditional jumps you learned that uh, jz jnz and so on and so forth they base their jumps on the status flags right it'll compare two operands and if the status flags meets the certain criteria of that jump then it, the jump will happen otherwise the jump won't happen they do the same thing, but the difference is they don't look at the status flags at all. They just base their jumps on whether or not two operands are equal. If two operands are equal in, in the case of JE, then the jumps happen. Now, JE is equivalent to JZ. Again, if the only difference is JE just jumps based on the two operands. If they're equal, then they jumps. Now, JNE jumps if the two operands are not equal. So if the two operands are not equal, then the jump happens. Now this is JCXZ. This is jump if CX is zero, and I'll show you how that works in a second. Let's open up MU8086. Let's start off by moving around some values. Let's um, start off by moving into AX, the value of 100. Let's move into BX, the value of 100. So now we have an AX value of 100 and bx we have a value also of 100 all right so let's use the compare instruction cmp and let's compare ax with bx right so it's going to compare ax with bx and it's going to subtract the two basically that's how that works so let's use je jump if equal right and uh, we have to create a label let's just say l2 right so down here let me create the label l2 and we have to end it with a colon uh, remember, every time you're creating a label, you have to end it with a colon. All right, so under this label, let's move around some values. Let's move into, let's say, dx, the value of 6, right? And underneath this uh, JE instruction, let's give it some value too. Let's say, move into dx, the value of 1, right? So let's clean this up a little bit. All right, so from the top again, we moved into AX, the value of 100, right? Now we moved into BX, the value of 100. So AX and BX both have a value of 100. 
so now we use the compare instruction. We're comparing AX with BX, right? So now the, the jump instruction is down here. So it's jump if equal. So it'll jump to label L2 if the AX and BX are equal. It knows if they're equal because we use this jump instruction. And they come now it'll compare AX and BX. And it, it does not look at the status flags. And it'll jump if both operands are equal. In this case, both operands are equal, so the jump will happen. So let's open up this emulator here. Let's, uh, first off, let's move this up here. So, and let's move this up here. All right, so now, again, it's not going to look at the status flags at all. Let's hit single step. Now, our uh, AX has a value of 100, right? Now, let's hit single step. Our BX has a value of 100. This, the way, uh, this over here, it's 64 because this is the hexadecimal of 100. This is 64 again because this is the hexadecimal of 100. So AX and BX both have a value of 100 over here. So now the compare instruction is highlighted. Once I hit single step, it's going to compare the two. Now our jump instruction is highlighted, right? So it, it, it'll look at both operands. If both operands are equal, it's going to jump to label two. and. This is label two, right? And it's going to highlight the first instruction in label two, and it's going to bypass this instruction here. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, it bypassed this instruction. It's because it, both operands were equal. And it, it, it would jump straight to the label. And in this case, is label L2. And it's highlighting the first instruction under the label. So that once we hit single step, DX should have a value of six. So let's hit single step. Now DX here has a value of six. So let's try another one. Let's open this up here. Let's try J and E jump if not equal, right? So let's keep both operands the same value, but let's just add an N in the middle here between J and E. So now we have to first close this here. All right, so let's start off by making this J and E jump if not equal, right? Uh, so it's going to do the same thing, right? In this case, the operands are equal, so the jump should not happen. So let's hit emulate. So our first uh, line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of 100, hit single step, AX has a value of 100. This is just the hexadecimal value of 100 here, 64. All right, the next step is highlighted, move into BX the value of 100, let's hit single step, now BX has a value of 100. The compare instruction is highlighted, so let's move single step. Now the jump if not equal instruction is highlighted, so this will only jump if both operands are not equal. In this case, both operands are equal, so the jump won't happen. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, the jump did not happen. It just moved to the instruction right underneath. All right, so now let's make them not equal to each other. So let's make, let's first close this. Let's make them not equal to each other. Let's make this one 200, right? So now they're not equal to each other, so the jump should happen. So let's hit emulate. So our first instruction is highlighted, move into AX the value of 200. So let's hit single step. Now AX has a value of 200. This C8 is a hexadecimal of the value of 200. So our second line of code is highlighted, move into BX100. Let's hit single step. Now our BX has a value of 100. So the compare instruction is highlighted. So let's hit single step. Now we're highlighting our jump if not equal instruction here. So it'll jump if both operands are not equal. So in this case, both operands are not equal, so the jump should happen. It should bypass this instruction and jump straight to this one here. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, it jumps straight to this instruction here and bypass this because both operands were not equal. So that's how that works. Let's try the last one here, J, C, X, Z, jump if C, X is zero. So I'll show you how that works right now. All right, let's delete this here. I'm just gonna delete all this. And let's move around some values. So let's move into CX, the value of say one, right? Let's move into AX, let's say the value of one. So AX and CX have a value of one. Now let's use a subtract instruction. SUB is the subtract instruction. Let's subtract CX. We want CX to be the destination operand because CX has to be altered. Right, if and it, the, this jump is going to be based on whether or not CX is equal to zero or not. So let's subtract CX with AX, and we want CX to be the destination, right? Let's use the J, C, X, Z instruction jump if CX is zero, right? So in this case, CX is zero, and let's create a label L2, right? Again, and let's 
also create the label down here, L2, comma, I'm sorry, L2 colon, and let's give it uh, some values underneath this label. So let's move into, say, DX, the value of, let's say, 1. And under here, let's give some values under this jump here. Let's say move into DX, let's say, 6. Let's start from the top. We moved into CX, the value of 1, right? We moved into AX, the value of 1. And uh, we subtract CX with AX. CX is the destination operand, so the results will be stored in CX. In this, in this case, 1 subtracted by 1 is 0, so CX will have a value of 0, right? So now this jump instruction is right under it. So this jump instruction only jumps if CX is 0. So it'll only jump to L2 if CX is 0, and it will completely bypass this if CX is 0. So in our case, CX is 0, so let's hit emulate and find out. Our first line of code is highlighted, move into CX the value of 1. Let's hit single step. CX over here has a value of 1. Now our second line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of 1. Let's hit single step. Now AX here has a value of 1, right? So now it's highlighting our subtract instruction. It's going to basically subtract CX and AX. CX is our destination operand, so the results will be stored in CX. So 1 take away 1 is 0, so CX should have a value of 0. Now let's hit single step. Now, as you can see, CX right here has a value of zero, right? Because we used the subtract uh, instruction. Now it's highlighting our jump here, J, C, X, C, jump if CX is zero. So in this case, CX is zero. So the jump should happen and it should bypass this instruction here. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, it completely bypassed this instruction and went straight to here. Let's hit single step. Now DX has a value of one. Let's uh, first close this. Let's make CX have a value of more than zero. So let's let's make this an add this time. AX and CX will have a value of two and the jump won't happen because this jump is based on whether or not CX is equal to zero. So let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted, moving to CX the value of one. Let's hit single step. CX has a value of one. Our second line of code is highlighted, moving to AX the value of one. Let's hit single step. AX has a value of one. Now our add instruction is highlighted, right? So now once I hit single step, it's going to add AX and CX, which both have a value of one, right? So, so th then it's going to move the results into CX because CX is our destination operand, right? So let's hit single step. And over here, as you can see, CX has a value of two because CX is the destination operand. Now our, our jump instruction is highlighted, J, C, X, Z, jump if CX is zero. In this case, CX is not zero because CX is two because we used the add instruction should the jump. The jump should not happen. And then we should go straight to this line of code here. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, we move down to this line of code here, moving to DX the value of six. So let's hit single step. Now DX has a value of six. So that's pretty much it. That's how that works. So if you guys enjoy this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rissim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about jumps based on unsigned comparison. So let's get started. So what are jumps based on unsigned comparison? So here are the jumps based on unsigned comparison instructions here. The first one is JA, jump if above. If left operand is greater than right operand, then the jump happens. So the next one is J N B E, jump if not below or equal. It's basically the same as J A. The next one is J A E, jump if not or equal. So basically, if the left operand is greater than or equal to the right, then the jump happens. So J N B, jump if not below, is the same as J A E. The next one is JB, jump if below. So if the left operand is less than the right operand, then the jump happens. So the next one is JNAE, jump if not above or equal, same as JB basically. The, the next one is JBE, jump if below or equal. So basically if the left operand is less than or equal to the right, then the jump happens. Now the final one is JNA, jump if not above. It's basically the same as JBE. So all right, so I'm gonna open up MU8086 here so we can test some of these out. So let's try the first one, JA, jump if not above. So the first thing we're gonna to need to do, I'm gonna minimize this. The first thing we're gonna to need to do is move around some values, right? Let's move into, let's say, AX, uh, let's say 10, right? And let's move into BX, let's say 11, right? So let's, uh, 
let's open this up. So the first one is jump if above. So if left operand is bigger than the right operand, the jump happens. So we're going to make the left bigger than the right. So let's compare. And let's make the, the AX the left one. I'm sorry, the BX the left one because it's greater. And let's compare it with AX, right? We know the compare operator. It doesn't uh, change the values. All it does is compare. It subtracts the two, right? And it compares. So now we're going to use the jump, right? So let's add the jump now. J, A is our instruction jump if above, right? If the left operating is greater than the right. So let's create a label. I'll call mine L1, right? So let's make our label down here. L1, and we have to add a colon. Every time we create a label, we have to add a colon at the end. If we're uh, using the label, if we're invoking the label, we don't have to add that colon only when we're creating the label. Now let's uh, add some instructions in between this here. Let's move around some values. Let's move into CX. Let's say 5, right? And let's move some values. Let's first tighten this up a little bit. Let's move some values uh, under the label. So let's move into CX, let's say four, right? So let's start from the top. We moved into AX, the value of 10, right? We moved into BX, the value of 11. So we compared it to, we wanted uh, BX to be the left operand, right? Because the left operand eh, is greater. So BX is the left and AX is the right. So the, this jump instruction, JA, jumps if the left operand is greater than the right. So in this case, the left operand is greater than the right. So it should jump to L1 here, and then it should move into uh, CX, the value of four. And I should uh, bypass this instruction here. Let's test it out. I'm gonna hit emulate. Okay, here, let's see. Our first uh, line of code is highlighted, move into AX, the value of 10, right? So once I hit single step, AX should have a value of 10. As you can see, AX has a value of 10. This is a hexadecimal value of 10 here. Now, our second line of code is highlighted, move into BX, the value of 11. I'm going to hit single step, and now BX has a value of 11. Now, our third instruction here is highlighted. Compare uh, BX with AX, right? BX is our left operand here. So it compares the two, right? And uh, once I hit single step, now our th our next uh, instruction is highlighted JA, jump if above, right? It uses the compare instruction, right? And, it, and it'll test whether or not the our left operand is greater than our right. If if, the, if that's so, then the jump happens. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, the jump happened. Then it completely bypassed this uh, instruction here and, and jumped right under this label. So now uh, this instruction here is highlighted, move into CX the value of four, right? So once I hit single step, CX should have a value of four. As you can see right here, CX has a value of four. So let's, uh, let's move around the values, right? Let's make the left operand smaller than uh, the right. So let's make this one 11. We have to close this first. Let's change uh, this AX to 11 and BX to 10, right? So now the right operand is greater than the left. So the jump will not happen. So let's hit emulate, right? Let's hit single step, single step, single step. Now we're highlighting our jump here, JA, and uh, the jump should not happen. So let's hit single step. Oops, let's hit single step. And the jump did not happen because the left operand was less than the right operand, and it went to the instruction right underneath. So once I hit single step, CX should have a value of 5 now. Let's try our next one. Let's close this here first. Let's open this up. Our next one is JNBE, jump if not above or equal. It's basically the same as JA, so let's just test it out. So JNBE, right? Let's replace this with JNBE, right? And let's make... Uh, the left value greater than the right. So I'm going to make this one a 10 again, and I'm going to make this one 11, right? Because our AX is, is our right operand and our BX is our left, and we want this jump to happen. So basically, N, J, N, B, E is the same as J, A, jump if above. So basically, this is jump if not below. It's pretty much the same. So let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of 10. Once I hit single step, AX has a value of 10. Our second line of code is highlighted, move into BX the value of 11. Again, once I hit single step, now BX has a value of 11. Our third instruction here is highlighted, the compare instruction, and we're comparing BX with AX, so let's hit single step. Now our jump instruction is highlighted, JNBE, jump if not above. So JNBE is jump if not below. So if our left operand is not below our right, then the jump happens. So our left operand is greater than our right, so the jump should happen. Let's hit single step. 
and the jump did happen. Completely bypass this instruction here and move straight to uh, the instruction under the label. So once I hit single step, it should move into CX the value of four. So let's hit single step. Now CX has a value of four. Let's switch these around again. Let's make this one 11. Okay, I gotta close this again. All right, let's make this one 11. Let's make BX 10, so the jump won't happen. So I'm gonna hit emulate. Let's hit single step. I'm gonna skip to the jump instruction. Now, once I hit single step, the jump should not happen. So let's hit single step, and as you can see, the jump did not happen, and it moved to an instruction underneath the jump. So I hit single step, CX should have a value of five. So single step, CX has a value of five. Let's try another one. Let's close this here. Let's try JAE, jump if above or equal. So if the left operand is greater than or equal to the right, then the jump will happen. So let's test it out, JAE, jump if above or equal. Right, let's first make them equal. I wanna make the, them both 11, right? So uh, basically they'll jump if the left is greater than or equal to. So in this case, it's equal to, so the jump should still happen. So let's hit emulate. I'm gonna hit single step, right? AX has a value of 11. Now I'm gonna hit single step. Now BX has a value of 11. Now the compare instruction is highlighted. I'm gonna hit single step. Now it's highlighting JAE, jump if uh, greater than or equal to, right? So let's hit single step and jump happened because the left operand and the right operand were equal to each other. So let's close this and try something else. Let's make the left greater than, right? So let's make BX 12 and the jump should still happen. So let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted, move into AX11, right? So let's hit single step. Now AX has a value of 11. This is the hexadecimal value of 11 here. So now let's hit single step and BX should have a value of 12. Now our compare instruction is highlighted. So let's hit single step. Now it's highlighting our jump instruction, JAE. So basically uh, if our left operator is either, either greater than or equal to the right, then the jump happens. It's so the left is greater than the right, so the jump should happen. Let's hit single step, the jump happened. It completely bypassed this instruction here. Now it's highlighting move into CX the value of four. So once I hit single step, CX should have a value of four and CX has a value of four now. Let's try another one. All right, so let's try J and B. It's basically the same as J, A, E. So let's try it. Let's replace this here. J, N, B, jump if not below, right? So it's basically, all right, so this is basically the same as the previous one, right? So if we leave the values the same, the jump should happen. So we jump if not below. So if the left is not below the right, the jump will happen. So let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of 11. Once we hit the single step, AX has the value of 11. Our second line of code is highlighted, move into BX the value of 12. Once I hit single step, BX should have a value of 12, and it does. Our third instruction here is highlighted, compare BX with AX, right? So now our jump here, jump if not below. So if the left operand is not below the right, the jump will happen. So in this case is true. The left operand is greater than the right, so the jump will happen. So let's hit single step. The jump happened, completely skip this instruction. Now uh, move into CX, the uh, value of four is highlighted. So once I hit single step, CX should have a value of four. So let's close this here. Let's move the values around. Let's make the jump not happen. Let's just make AX greater than BX. So make AX 13, right? So once, uh, once I hit emulate, our first line of code here is highlighted. Move into AX the value of 13. Let's hit single step. AX has a value of 13. Move into BX the value of 12. Once I hit single step, BX here now has a value of 12. O is highlighted. So basically, uh, the left is below the right. So the jump will not happen. So let's hit single step. The jump did not happen. It's highlighting the instruction right underneath the jump. Let's hit single step. Now CX has a value of 5. So let's try another one. Let's try JB, jump if below. Basically, jump if left is below the right. So let's try it out. Let's replace this with just a B here. So JB. So the the left, if the left is less than the right, the jump happens. So in this case, is true. So BX is less than AX. So it is less than the right. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit single step. Move into uh, AX. The value of 13 is our first instruction. Let's hit single step. AX will have a, a value of 13. Now our second line of code is highlighted, move into BX the value of 12. Once I hit single step, now BX should have a value of 12, and it does. So our third instruction is highlighted, compare BX with AX, so I hit single step. Now it's highlighting our jump here, our jump instruction, JB jump if below. If the left operand is below the right, the jump will happen. In this case, it's true. So let's hit single step, 
and the jump happened. Now we're highlighting our uh, instruction under the jump and it's moving to CX the value of four. So once I hit CX single step, CX should have a value of four. And it does, CX now has a value of four. Let, let's just switch around the value so it's not true. So let's make this one 12. Let's make this one 13, right? So let's hit emulate, hit single step, hit single step, hit single step. Now our jump instruction here is highlighted. So once I hit single step, the jump will not happen. As you can see, the jump did not happen. Now, once I hit single step, we're going to move into CX the value of five. As you can see now, CX has a value of five, right? So it's basically jump if below. It wasn't below, it was above. Or actually, they were equal to each other. So the jump did not happen. So the jump only will take place if the left operand was below the right. Since they were equal, jump did not happen. Let's try another one. Let's try J-N-A-E, jump if not above or equal it's basically the same as jb if jump if below so um let's try it out j and a e j and a e is our instruction right so basically it's the same so let's make our left operand below the right right so bx is our left ax our right let's make bx 12 so our left operand is below the right so the jump should happen let's hit emulate our first line of code is highlighted here, moving to x the value of 13. So once I hit single step, ax will have a value of 13. So our next one here, moving to bx, the value of 12. Once I hit single step, bx should have a value of 12, which it does. So now our jump uh, instruction is highlighted jump, if not above or equal. So the, the jump should happen. Let's hit single step, and the jump happened, right? So the jump happened because the, the left operand is uh, below the right. So the jump happened. So uh, now it's highlighting moving to CX the value of four. Once I hit single step, CX should have a value of four. And as you can see, CX has a value of four, right? Let's try something else now. Sorry, let's try JBE now, right? Jump if below or equal. So if the left operand is below or equal to the right, then the jump happens, right? So what was the instruction again? Okay, it was JB. Let's open up MU8086. Let's minimize this. Let's replace this with JBE. Jump if below or equal, right? So if the operand, if the left operand is below or equal to the right, then the jump happens. So let's make them equal. So since they're equal, the jump will happen, right? So let's hit emulate. Let's just skip to the jump instruction. Once I hit single step, the jump should happen, right? As you can see, the jump happened to completely bypass this instruction here because they were both either below or equal. In this case, they were equal. So let's make the left operand uh, below the right. So the BX is the left, so let's make this a 12, so it's below the right. So the jump will also happen. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit single step, single step. Let's just skip to the jump instruction here. So once, so once I hit single step, the jump should happen, right? So hit single step, the jump happened because the left is, was below the right, right? So let's hit single step again. Now CX has a value of four. Pretty cool, right? So let's try another one, All right? The last one here, JNA. It's basically the same as JBE, jump if not below, right? So let's tr try it out, JNA. Right. So if the left is not below the right, the jump will happen. So uh, let's make this a 13. So the jump will happen because the, the left operand is not below the right. So they're equal. So the jump should still happen. Let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted. Move into AX, the value of 13. Let's hit single step. AX now has a value of 13. Now our second line of code is, is highlighted. Move into BX, the value of 13. Let's hit single step. BX now has a value of 13. Our compare instruction is highlighted. Once I hit single step, it's going to compare BX with AX. Now our jump here, jump if not below basically. So they're equal to each other, so the jump should still happen. And the jump did happen. So now we're moving into CX, the value of four. Once I hit single step, CX here now has a value of four. All right, so that's pretty much it for this tutorial. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossMurtech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossMurtech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about a conditional loop instruction called loop Z, loop if zero. Now loop if zero is identical to the loop instruction. The only difference is it has an extra condition. The zero flag must be set for the loop to continue to happen. So I'll show you guys the syntax right now of the loop Z instruction. This is the syntax. Loop Z is our instruction. Then we, we hit space and we type in our destination, which is normally a label, right? So 
if ECX or CX, depending on if you're using a 32-bit or a 16-bit operand. If you're, using, if you're using a 32-bit operand, then you use ECX as the counter. If you're using a 16-bit operand, then CX is the counter. So if ECX or CX is greater than zero, right? Because one, if it hits zero, then the loop uh, stops. And if the ZF, the zero flag is set to one, the, the loop happens, otherwise the loop stops. So let's open up MU8086 so I can show you exactly how it works. The first thing I want to do is type in a label, right? I'm going to call mine top and we have to end it with a colon because it's a label, right? On the bottom here, we're going to end it with a uh, loop, Z instruction and hit space, then type in our label name, which is top. So this is the body of this loop Z instruction here, right? So the, it'll keep jumping to the top of this uh, label here and it'll highlight whatever code is under the label. It'll keep doing that as long as the ECX or CX is is greater than zero and the zero flag is set to one. It'll keep the loop going, otherwise the loop will stop. Now, since uh, it's a loop instruction, right, we, we gotta use CX or ECX as a counter. Since I'm gonna work with 16-bit uh, operands, I'm gonna use CX as the counter, so we gotta set uh, a value for CX, so I'm gonna move into CX, the value of five. Because I want this to loop five times, so now we set the counter to five, right? The, as, every time the loop happens, the CX gets decremented by one. So once uh, CX is equal to zero, the loop stops. You gotta remember, the loop will only take place as long as the CX uh, register is greater than zero and the zero flag is set to one. So the zero flag must be set to one for the loop to take place. But in this loop, I wanted to print a character on the screen. I'll, I wanted to print character five. So we're gonna move into DL, right? Five. Now we gotta add into DL 48. The reason we're adding into DL 48 is because we wanna convert this integer value of five into character five. So it prints character five on the screen, right? Now we're going to move into AH to H, that's the code for print character. Then we're gonna type in INT, hit space 21H is the code just like do it. Basically INT 21H initializes whatever you want it to do. So now let's tighten this up a little bit. All right, so let's hit emulate and let's hit run. All right, as you can see here, it only printed out a five one time. So the loop did not uh, continue going on. The reason the loop didn't continue going on is because as you can see here, the zero flag was not set. The zero flag is zero. How do we set the zero flag? We can use the compare instruction because the compare instruction does not alter any operand. It only alters the flag. So we can add another value on top of the loop here, right? We can move into let's say BX let's say five, let's move into BX the value of f five, right? So now uh, we moved into BX the value of five, right before the loop instruction here, I'm going to use the compare instruction, CMP, and I'm gonna compare BX with five, right? So you, we all know that the compare instruction does not alter the operands, all it does, it's alter the flex. It basically subtracts uh, both operands and uh, then depending on the results, it alters the flag. In this case, it's gonna subtract five with BX. I gave BX a value of five, so then the zero flag should be set to one, and then the loop will keep on continuing. So let's hit emulate, let's hit run. So the loop kept on continuing because the zero flag was set to one because we compared a BX with five right before the zero flag, so the zero flag was always set to one, and now uh, this, we gave uh, the value of five to CX, so every time the loop happens, the CX register gets decremented by one, and uh, right, so then once uh, the CX register has a value of zero, then the loop stops, so that's why you printed out five, five times. All right, that's pretty much it. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to talk about another conditional loop called loop E. Now loop E is identical to loop Z. In my last tutorial, I showed you guys how loop Z works. It's completely identical. It means loop if equal, basically if the zero flag is set. Now, since it's a conditional loop, right? 
it works uh, almost the same as a regular loop, right? The only difference is it has a extra condition. First, the first condition, we, we all know that uh, the CX flag is the counter, right? So for the loop to happen, the CX uh, or ECX, depending on if you're using a 16-bit or a 32-bit operand, has to be greater than zero, right? Once the CX register hits zero, the loop stops. But since it's a conditional jump, the zero flag must be set as well. The zero flag has to be set for one and the CX or ECX register has to be greater than zero for the loop to continue. So let's open up MU8086. Since uh, this is identical to the loop Z, I am gonna use the same code that I used in my last tutorial. But the only difference is I, I added a few uh, comments on the side to help us out here. Now. Uh, as you can see here, I, I just added the loop E instruction in place of the loop C. So this is the exact same code we used in our last tutorial. I'm going to describe what every uh, line of code does here. Now the first line of code here, we moved into uh, CX the value of 5. We moved into CX the value of 5 because we want we, we want to set the CX counter to 5. We want this loop to continue 5 times. right? Now we moved into BX the value of 5 as well. The reason we moved into BX the value of 5 is because right before the loop instruction down here, uh, we, we want to compare BX with 5. We, we want to set the zero flag so, so, so the loop continues, right? So that, that, that's the main reason why we moved into BX the value of 5. So we could compare down here BX with 5. So the zero flag is set. So the loop continues. Now, over here, this is our loop label, right? This is the label that the loop is going to jump to. And once the loop jumps, it'll uh, highlight uh, the first line of code under the, the label, which would be uh, move into DL the value of 5. Now, we moved into DL the value of 5 because we want the, the 5 to print on the, out on the screen, right? And uh, we added into DL48 because we, we want to convert uh, that value of 5 into character 5. So it prints character 5 on the, on the screen, right? So our next line of code here is move into AH. To H. This is the code for print character. So whatever value is in the DDL register, it'll print on the screen. INT21H is the code to like initialize the whatever code you want it to do. Like in this case, to move into AH2H, it's just a code for do it. It just means do it. Now under here is compare BX with, with value of 5. I just explained to you why we are comparing BX with 5. The reason we're comparing BX with the value of 5 is because we want to set the zero flag, right? The compare instruction sets the zero flag. So we want the zero flag to be set, right? The zero flag would only be set if these two operands are equal. In this case, BX has a value of 5 and we're comparing BX with 5. So they're both equal, so the zero flag should be set. So the loop will continue. So underneath here, we have the loop E instruction, right? Loop if equal. So, so the loop will happen if, again, CX or ECX is greater than 0. Once, zero, once it reaches 0, then the loop stops. And if the ZF flag is set to 1. So those two conditions have to be met for the loop to happen. So let's hit emulate. Let's hit run, right? And as you can see over here, it printed out five, five times. That's exactly what we wanted it to do. So again, this is pretty simple. The loop E instruction is identical to the loop Z instruction. Basically, it's, it's a loop instruction with a extra condition. The extra condition is the zero flags have to be set. All right, so that's, so that's pretty much it for this tutorial. If you guys like this tutorial, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissin from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, Emerson from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to talk about the SHL instruction, so let's get started. Now the SHL instruction performs a logical left shift on the destination operand, filling the lowest bit with a zero, and the highest bit gets moved to the carry flag. So whatever was in the carry flag before gets discarded, so I'll show you how that works right now. So this is the syntax of a SHL instruction here. We start off by typing in SHL, that's our instruction, we hit space, we type in our destination operand, comma, then we type in our count. Our count will move the bits over. So if you have a count of one, well, one bit will be moved over, or, or would be shift over to the left, basically. We, our count could be anything we want, so I'll show you how that works right here. So let, let's pretend our destination operand had a value of one, right? This, so this is a binary 8-bit value of one. Let's say we used the SHL destination. This is the results of the SHL instruction, right? Our lowest bit, this is our lowest bit, gets moved, it gets uh, zero, 
everything gets moved over, right? And then uh, this zero gets moved to the CF register and everything else gets shifted over one. And then the, again, the lowest bit gets a zero. So this would be our answer here. It would be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, zero, right? It would be, this would be our answer and this is a two. So ha, ha, we can figure out our answer by using a mathematical equation, right? So the, the way this works is our value of our destination operand. Here we have a value of one. That depends on the value, whatever value you give it, right? It's the value of the destination operand times two to the n power. And that's our answer. The n power, I mean, the n is the count, whatever we put as the count. I, I use the count of one. But you can have a count of two, three, doesn't matter, right? So again, let's, let's start from the top. Uh, the value of the destination operand, which is one, right? So one times two to the n, n being the count, right? So two to the uh, one power would be a two, right? So, so basically it's one times two, and our answer equals two. And as you can see, this is the binary version of two. So let's test it out in MU8086 here. So let's open this up here. Let's close this and open up another window. Okay. Let's open up another window here. Okay. So we got to move something to a destination operand. I want to use AX as our destination operand. So I'm going to move into AX the value of one because I'm going to uh, repeat this example, but I'm going to show you how it works in a program, right? So now we're going to use the SHL instructions. We're going to type in SHL. That's our instruction. We can hit space. Then we're going to type in our destination operand, which is AX right here, right? Now we gotta give it a count, right? We want it to count. Again, we used one before, but you can make it two, three, whatever. It depends on how many bits you want it to shift over. So I'm gonna use a count of one. So again, we know our answer was two. So let's test it out. I'm gonna hit emulate here, right? So right now it's highlighting our first instruction, move into AX to value of one. Once I hit single step, AX should have a value of one. I'm gonna hit single step. As you can see, AX now has a value of one. So now it's highlighting our second instruction, the SHL instruction here. So, so we SHL'd the AX register because the AX is our destination and we, and we used the count of one. So it's gonna shift over one bit. So our, our answer should be two. So let's hit single step. And as you can see, AX now has a value of two. Let's, let's try something else out here. So I'm gonna show you guys how that works here again. All, all, all that all that's happening is since we're using a count of one, right? Uh, our lowest bit should be changed to a zero, right? Our other bits are going to be moved forward, and then our highest bit is going to be moved into CF, and whatever was in CF before gets deleted. So that's how we got two. If we had a count of two, uh, the highest. The, um, so if we use a count of two, these two bits would be uh, zero. The one would be here and everything would be shifted over and then our highest bit would be moved into CF again. So let's test that out right now. So let's use a count of two, right? So we're gonna use a count of two, but let me show you what, what the answer, so let me show you what the answer would be. So, so this would be a one here. So we know this here, let's find out what a value in binary, this binary number is here. So let's oh, copy this, I'm gonna open up this web page here and this is a binary conversion binary to decimal to hexadecimal converter and i'm going to leave the link in my description if you guys are interested but let's paste this onto this binary here so we know what the decimal version of this would be so let's hit actually this is not it let's type in one so this is one two three four five six seven eight so that's eight bits right so let's hit let's hit enter here and see why it, and it's a four right so we know this is a four here. So let's test it out in the program. So if we use a count of two and our destination has a value one, the answer should be four. So again, we have a value of one in our destination, right? So the value times two to the n will give us our answer, the n being the count. So if we use a count of two, so, so one times two to the second power, two times two is four. So one times four is four. So that's how we got our answer. So let's test it out here. Again, we, we changed our count of one to a count of two. Let's hit emulate. Our first line of code is highlighted here, moving to AX to value one. Once I hit single step, AX should have a value of one and AX now has a value of one. Our second line of code is highlighted, SHL, right? And uh, we wanna SHL our destination, which is AX. AX has a value of one, remember? And uh, we use the count of two. So let's see, see what happens. I'm gonna hit single step. And now, as you can see, 
AX has a value of four now. So that's that's pretty cool, right? So that's pretty much it. That's how that works. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rustin from RustinMertech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rustin from RustinMertech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm going to show you guys how to use the SHR instruction. So let's get started. Now the SHR instruction performs a logical right shift on a destination operand. Replacing the highest bit with a zero, the lowest bit is copied to the carry flag. And whatever was in the carry flag before gets overwritten. Now, if you guys watched my last tutorial, I showed you guys how to use the S. HL instruction, the shift to the left. Now it's basically the same thing, but with the SHR instruction, you're shifting to the right instead of the left. So I'll show you how that works right now. So this is the syntax of a SHR instruction. We type SHR, we hit space, we hit the space button, we type in our destination operand, comma, hit space, then we type in our count, how, how many counts, how many times we want uh, the shift to happen. So now right here, as you can see, it shifts to the right, not the left. And our last deterrent, like I said, the SHL instruction shifts to the left, this one shifts to the right. Now the highest bit here, the highest bit here gets replaced with a zero, everything shifts over right here, and the lowest bit here gets copied to the carry flag. So now let's say we had, uh, I'll use I'll use an 8-bit operand as a, a uh, example here. Let's say we had this here, 4, 5, 6, 1, 0, right? This here, let's make sure it's 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? This is 2 in binary, right? So if we use the SHR instruction here and we use a count of 1, everything will be shifted over 1, right? So whatever was here will get replaced with a 0. Everything gets shifted over 1. This 1 here will be at the end here, it will be the lowest bit. So this is how it will look here. And this would be a one. And whatever was in this lowest bit here would get uh, moved to the carry flag. So this would be, uh, this two would turn to a one. Now there's a uh, mathematical equation we could use to uh, find out what our value would be when we use the SHR instruction. We use the value of our destination operand, right? Whatever value the destination operand has divided by two, to the n power, n being the count. Now, if you have a count of one, you replace this with one. So, since we use the count of one, right, uh, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Now, our destination operand had a value of two, right? So, two divided by two to the n, n being the count, n was a one. We always use a count of one. So, two to the first power is two, right? So basically over here, two divided by two is one. So our answer here now is a one. When we use the SHR instruction, our answer became a one. So let me show you how that works in MU8086 here. I'm going to use the same example, but I'm gonna just going to write in the code. So I'll show you how it works. We have to start off by moving around some values. I'm going to move into AX because AX is going to be our destination upper end. I want to move the value of two, right? So now AX has a value of two. Now we're gonna use the SHR instruction. So I'm gonna type in SHR, hit space. We're gonna type in our destination operand, which is the AX register, comma. Then we're gonna uh, type in our count, how many uh, times we want this to shift over. I I'm gonna use a count of one. So let's test it. I'm gonna hit emulate here. Now our first line of code is highlighted, move into AX the value of two. So once I hit single step, AX should now have a value of two. And now AX has a value of two. So our second line of code is highlighted here, the SHR instruction, right? So once I hit single step, now AX has a value of one because I showed you down here. So as, as you see here, we had a value of two in our destination, right? Then we used the SHR instruction, right? So once that happened, all the bits got shifted over one. The highest bit, uh, zero was added. Everything was shifted over and the lowest bit was moved to the carry flag. So that's how we got an answer of one. So pretty cool, right? So let's open this up again. So that's pretty much it. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rustin from RustinMertech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rustin from RustinMertech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class, I'm gonna show you guys how to use the SAL instruction. Now the SAL instruction, short for shift arithmetic left, the instruction works the same as the SHL instruction. For each shift count, SEL shifts each bit in the destination operand to the next highest bit position. The lowest bit is assigned zero, and the highest bit is moved to the carry flag. So I'll show you how that works right now. 
over here, this is our syntax of a SAL instruction. This is how it looks. We start off by typing in SAL, we hit space, we type in our destination operand, then we hit comma, then we hit space, then we type in our count. Now our count is how many bits we wanted to shift over. Uh, if you want to shift over one bit, you can put a count of one. If you want to shift over two bits, then you'll put a count of two. So down here, this is an example of a 8-bit uh, binary value, right? This is a binary value of one, right? So if we use the SAL instruction, right? What would happen is, I'll show you right here, every, all the bits would move to the left, right? This lowest bit here will, will, be, uh, will get replaced with a zero. This one would be shifted over. All the zeros would shift over. And what ever was in this highest bit would be moved to the CF uh, flag. So let's let's let me give you an example of how it looks right here. It would be zero, 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 five, six, one, zero. So let's just line them up. Now again, if we use the SAL instruction we can use the count of one, remember? Uh, all the bits would be shifted over to the left one. The lowest bit would be replaced with a zero. Everything else would be moved over, and whatever was in the highest bit here would be moved over to the CF flag. So let's open up MU8086 so I can give you an example of how it works. Let's start off by moving some values around. I'm going to move into AL, because AL is an 8-bit uh, destination, or 8-bit operand. And I'm going to move into AL an 8-bit value, and it's going to be a value of 1. So I'm going to type in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros and one, because this is binary for one here. And since it's a binary value, we're going to type in B at the end, or Boolean, basically. Um, now, let's use the SAL instruction. We're going to type in SAL, because that's our instruction. We're going to hit space. We're going to type in our destination operand. Our destination operand is AL. So we're going to type in AL, comma, hit space. Now we're going to type in our count. Again, our count is how many times do we want this to shift over to the left. I want it to shift over to the left one time, so I'm going to type in one. So let's hit emulate. Now our first line of code here is highlighted, right? Move into AL, the binary value of one, 8-bit binary value one. So once I hit single step, AL should have a value of one. And as you can see, AL now has a value of one. Now our second line of code here is highlighted. That This is our SAL instruction. And uh, once I hit single step, the AX should have a value of two. Because remember, uh, once we uh, use the AL instruction, right, and uh, we uh, use the count of one, and in our destination operand we had a value of one, our results would be two. So let's just test that out. I'm gonna hit single step here. And as you can see, AL now has a value of two, and it's pretty simple. Now, if you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to show you guys how to use the SAR instruction, so let's get started. Now the SAR instruction is short for Shift Arithmetic Write. This instruction performs a write arithmetic shift on its destination operand. Now this instruction is identical to the SHR instruction. So let me show you how that works right now. Let's open up this word pad here. Now this is the syntax of a SAR instruction. We start off by typing in SAR, we hit space. We type in our destination operand, we hit comma, we hit space again, then we type in our count. Our count is how many times we want this to shift over to the right. If we have a count of one, it will shift over once to the right. If we have a count of two, it will shift over twice to the right. So down here, this kind of just show you how it, it works. Uh, this is a 8-bit operand here. This is a 8-bit binary. And this is a value of two, right, over here. Now, if we use the SAR instruction and we have a count of one, uh, everything gets shipped over one, the highest bit, it's replaced by zero, everything shifts over one, and whatever was in the lowest bit here gets uh, moved to the CF flag, it's copied to the CF flag. So this is the result of a SAR with a count of one. Let me show you how that works in MU8086. Let me just open it up here, let's minimize this. Let's start off by moving some values around. I'm gonna move into AL, this binary value here of zero, 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 zero. So I think I added an extra zero, but let's just, just count it. It should be eight here. It should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I got eight uh, bits here, right? So this is binary for two, right? This one bit here is a two. So since this is a binary code here, we have to make sure we, we add B to the end of this. 
So we're moving this binary code or this binary value. It's an 8-bit value and it has a value of 2 into AL. AL, AL is going to be our operand, our destination operand, right? So that's why I used AL because AL is an 8-bit uh, register. So now let's use the SAR instruction. Let's type in SAR. We're going to hit space. Let's just line them up first. So again, we're going to hit space. We're going to type in our destination operand. Our destination operand is AL. So we're going to hit comma again. Now we're going to hit space. Now we're going to type in our count. Again, a count is how many times you want it to shift over to the right. I only want it to shift over to the right one time, so I'm going to have a count of one, so I'll add one here. So let's hit emulate to see what happens. I'm going to hit emulate now. Now our first line of code is highlighted and move into AL, this 8-bit binary code here, which is a binary code for 2. So once I hit single step, AL should have a value of 2. So let's hit single step. As you can see here, AL has a value of 2. Now our second line of code is highlighted, the SAR instruction. So once I hit single step, uh, AX should have a value of 1. So let's hit single step. Now as you can see, AX ha now has a value of 1. I'll explain to you why AX has a value of 1. So let's open this up here. Remember, we moved into AL this binary code here for 2, right? But then when we use the SAR instruction and uh, we use the count of 1, uh, it turned into this. This is binary for 1. So that's why we got a result for 1. Again, the highest bit gets replaced by 0. Everything else shifts over 1. So this 1 gets shifted over here. All the zeros shift over. And this 0 gets moved into the CF register. So that's how we got a result of this here. So that's why we have a value of 2 in our uh, AL register now. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and thanks for watching. What's up guys? I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. In this class, I'm going to show you guys how to use the MUL instruction or short for multiplication. So let's get started. I'm going to first open up this notepad here. So this is the syntax here of a MUL instruction and there are three versions, right? You can either use uh, MUL, type in MUL, which is the instruction, hit space, type in a 8-bit register or 8-bit memory, right? The second version is we're typing in MUL, hit space, and type in either a 16-bit register or a 16-bit memory. Now the third version here, we're typing in MUL, we're going to hit space, we're going to type in a 32-bit register or 32-bit memory. All right, the way it works is uh, whatever is in AL will get multiplied automatically, so you have to move values that you want to multiply in AL, right? It'll mu multiply with whatever uh, operand you put next to this multiplication instruction. So if it's a uh, 16, if, sorry, if it's an 8-bit uh, value, you can put a, a BL, or you can put a 8-bit uh, memory operand in there. So it'll multiply the two together, and the results get stored in AX. So I'll show you how that works right now. But um, first, let's let me show you this example. So we're gonna move into AL 2H, right? So then we're gonna move into BL 5H. So this is the MUL instruction here. We can type in MUL and hit space and type in our operand we want to multiply, which is BL. So it's automatically going to first uh, multiply whatever's in AL, right? It's going to look for whatever's in AL, then multiply it with BL because we, this is our operand we chose to multiply. So 2 times 5 should be 10. So right here. So 2H times 5 equals 10H, right? And uh, the results get stored in AX, right? And the zero flag is not set because it was no overflow. So. Let's open up MU8086 here so I can show you how it works. So let's start off by moving around some values. Let's move into AL, say 5H, right? Let's move into BL, 2H. Let's hit uh, space a couple of times. Let's use the multiplication or MUL instruction. Type in MUL, hit space. Type in the operand we want to uh, multiply. It has to be an 8-bit operand because we're using 8-bit uh, registers up here. So I'm going to type in BL, right? So it's automatically going to look for whatever's in AL, right? It's going to multiply that with whatever operand you chose to put next to the multiplication uh, instruction here. So it's going to multiply AL with BL. So the results should get stored in AX. So let's hit emulate here. So our first line of code here is highlighted. Move into AL5H. Once I hit single step, AL should have 5, and it does. So our second line of code is highlighted. Move into BL2H. So once I hit single step, BL should have 2H, so I'm going to hit single step, 
as you can see, BL has two H now, right? Now our third line of code is highlighted, the MUL instruction, the multiply instruction, and we chose a operand of, of 8 bits, and it's a 8 bit register, BL. So it's gonna multiply BL with AL because it's gonna automatically look for whatever's in AL, right? And we, and we put 5H in AL, and we put uh, 2H in BL. So it's gonna multiply uh, five and two, So and the results will be stored in AX. So, so let's see what happens. I'm gonna hit single step. Now AX has a value of 0A, that's hexadecimal. So I'm going to copy this here. I'm going to open up my browser. And I have this uh, binary to decimal to hexadecimal uh, page open. I'm going to leave it in the description if you guys are interested. I'm going to uh, paste it here in hexadecimal. And, uh, and I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, decimal of uh, 0A is 10. So our answer was 10. Let's look at this example here. There's an example of a 16-bit version here. So we're going to move into AX, let's say 2000H, right? So then we're going to move into BX, 100H. So it's automatically going to look for uh, whatever's in AX. So when we use the multiplication instruction, the MUL instruction down here, and we type in our operand, it's going to first look at AX. It's going to multiply whatever's in AX with the operand we chose to put next to this multiplication instruction, which is BX, and BX has a value of 100. So 2000H times 100H should be 200,000 here. And uh, the carry flag would be set to one. The reason the carry flag would be set to one is because for the, the last four bits here, it's for the AX register. The results will get stored in the AX register. And the, the, the first four bits here, it's for the DX register. So if the, the result is uh, greater than four digits, the carry flag would be set and, and uh, the rest would be shifted over to DX here. So uh, you, you would add a zero and then the rest would be shifted over to DX. That's how we would get the answer. So let's try it out. So let's open up this here. Let's replace AL with AX. All right, let's replace BL with BX. Let's change BL again to BX. Let's change, uh, what, what value do we have? Okay, let's make AL have a value of 200H, all right? or 2000 H, I'm sorry, and BX have a value of 100 H, right? So let's hit emulate to see what happens. So the first line of code here is highlighted, move into AX 2000 H. So once I hit single step, AX should have 2000 H, and it does, as you can see here. So our second line of code here is highlighted, move into BX 100 H. Once I hit single step, BX should have 100 H, and it does right here. Now, our third uh, line of code here is highlighted, multiply BX, right? We hit multiply, we type in MUL, we hit space, and we hit our operating we want to multiply. It first looks for our uh, AX. It looks to see whatever's in AX. It multiplies that with whatever uh, operand you chose to put next to this multiplication instruction. In this case, it's BX. So AX has a value of 2000H. BX has a value of 100H. Once I hit single step here, now uh, AX here is zero, right? Because the first four uh, digits are, are, are used. If, if, if the number... Uh, goes over our carry flag here is set so let's see what the flag our carry flag is set to one and uh, the other uh, four bits get stored into dx so it's 2000 as you can see here so that's pretty much it for this tutorial i'll go over it one more time from the beginning let's not close this so again we moved into ax 2000h right so then we moved into bx 100h so when we use the multiplication instruction with a 16-bit operands and 16-bit register right the, the number gets stored in uh, DX and AX together, as you can see right here, DX and AX together. If the number is greater than four digits, some, some of the number gets stored in DX, right? So I'll give you an example of how that would look here. So our, our, we, we got 200,000, right? So there's eight bits, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 200,000 would be here, the two would be here, right? So the AX would be all zeros. Sorry, from here, AX. This is AX portion. This is the BX, or I'm sorry, the DX portion. Since the, the number is greater than four bits, the carry flag was set, and uh, the remainder of the number was moved into DX. So that's how we got a DX here with a value of 20, and the AX with a value of uh, four zeros. So that's pretty much it for this tutorial. If you guys like this tutorial, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rasim from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to show you guys how to use the divide or div instruction. So let's get started. Let's open up WordPad here. Now, 
this is the syntax of a divide instruction here or div instruction now the first version here we type in div we hit space we type in a 8-bit register or 8-bit memory location our second version again we type in div we hit space we type in either a 16-bit register or a 16-bit memory location now our third version here we type in div we hit space and we type in either a 32-bit register or a 32-bit memory location so down here our dividend is ax right now we're going to store the number that we want to divide into right so ax is going to store the number that we're going to divide into now our divisor can either be a 8-bit register or a 8-bit memory location. So what happens is we store the number that we want to divide into into AX, right? Now our divisor is going to be a, either a register or a memory location that's 8-bit. We're going to store a number that we want to divide from. Let's say uh, we want to divide 2 by 100, right? We would store 100 into AX. AX is our divided here. Then we would store into, let's say, BL, because BL would be our 8-bit divisor. We would store into BL2. So when we use the divide instruction, it'll, it'll divide the two, right? The quotient would be stored in AL, and the remainder would be stored in AH. So I'll show you how that works right now. Let's open up MU8086 here. So now the first thing we're going to need to do here is move around some values. So let's move into AX. Because remember, AX here is our dividend, right? So we can move it to AX. So let's say 0, 0, 080H, right? We're going to move into AX 80H, right? So this is our dividend here. All right, so now we need a divisor. So let's hit enter here and let's move into BL because BL is an 8 bit register and we're going to move into BL uh, a value we want to divide to. So let's say 2 because I want to divide 2 into 80, or I want to divide 80 by 2, basically. So we, we have our uh, value here, 80, which is into AX. AX is our dividend. Now we moved 2 into BL, and BL is our divisor. So now we need our divide instruction. To, to uh, start the divide instruction, we type in DIV, we hit space, and now we're going to type in our divisor, which is BL. So once I hit emulate here, uh, our first line of code here is highlighted. Let's just move this over here so you can see better. Our first line of code here is highlighted. Move into AX 80H. So once I hit single step here, a, uh, X should have a value of 80H. So let's hit single step. Now, as you can see, AX here has a value of 80H. This is the whole AX register it consists of AH and AL, right? So now our second line of code here is highlighted. Move into BL. BL is our divisor, 2, right? So once I hit single step, BL should have 2. As you can see here, BL has a value of 2. Now our final code is highlighted. This is the divide instruction, DIV, and we're dividing our divisor, which is BL, right? So I'm going to hit single step. And as you can see, AL, remember, AL here has a value of 40. And as you can see from over here, AL, AL here is our quotient that stores our number, and AH stores our remainder. So AL is our quotient. AL has a value of 40. So uh, 80 divided by 2 is 40, and it has no remainder. H would, would have our remainder, and it has a remainder of 0. So 80 divided by 2 is 40 here. So let's try our second version. I'm going to close this here. Now uh, let's open up the notepad again. Let's just minimize this here. So now our second version here, we stored the value of our divided into dx and ax together, right? So I'll show you how that works right now. Let's open up MU8086, and let's delete this here. All right, so now we're going to move around some values. Now we're going to move into dx, the value of 0h, right? So I'm move into dx, 0h, because dx is our first part of our dividend. Now we're going to move into ax, a value, right? Let's move into ax. Let's say um, 1, 2, 3. Let's say, again, 80h, right? And now we need a divisor. In this case, the divisor has to either be a 16-bit register or a 16-bit memory location. So I'm going to use BX this time. So we're going to move into BX. Let's say uh, 2, the value of 2. Now we're going to use the divide instruction. So we're going to type in DIV. And our divisor is BX. So we're going to type in BX. Now let's hit emulate here. Let's see what happens. Now over here, let's just move this over. Over here, our first line of code is highlighted. Move into dx, the value of 0, h. So I'm going to hit single step. Now dx here has a value of 0, right? 
that's the first part of our divide in, right? So now uh, our second line of code here is highlighted move into AX ADH, right? So once I hit single step, uh, AX should have a value of ADH. When it's single step, now AX has a value of ADH. So now our third line of code here is highlighted move into BX. BX is our divisor, remember that, the value of two. Once I hit single step, BX should have a value of two and BX has a value of two now. So our final code is highlighted the divide instruction and we're dividing our divisor BX and BX remember is a 16 bit register. So I'm gonna hit single step here. And now as you can see, uh, AX has a value of 40. Remember AX is our quotient and uh, the DX would be our remainder. So since there was no remainder, uh, AX has a value of 40. So 80 divided by two is 40. That's just the second version of this. This is if we're working with 16 bit values, right? So yeah, that's pretty much it. Let, let, let's just mess around with this for a bit. Let's say we did have a remainder. Let's make, let's create a remainder. So let's make, uh, let's first close this here. Let's make uh, AX have a value of 83, right? So let's hit emulate. Let's see what happens. So our first line of code here is highlighted move into DX, the value of 0H. Let's hit single step. And as you can see, DX has a value of 0 now. Our second line of code is highlighted move into AX, a value of 83. Remember, we're going to use 83 as the number we want to divide into. So once I hit single step, now AX has a value of 83 over here, as you can see. Our third line of code is highlighted move into BX. BX is our divisor, the value of 2. So I'm going to hit single step. Now BX has a value of 2. Now, again, this is our final line of code. This is the divide instruction, and it's dividing our divisor BX, which is a 16-bit register, and BX has a value of 2. So once I hit single step, now, remember, AX is our quotient, and DX is our divisor. As you can see here, AX has a value of 41, because 83 divided by 2 is 41, and it has a remainder of 1 down here, and DX holds our remainder. So that's pretty cool, right? Right, guys so that's pretty much it for this video if you guys like this video please give me a like if you want more videos like this please subscribe to my channel i'm rasim from rasmertech.com and thanks for watching what's up guys i'm rasim from rasmertech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming now in this class we're going to create a program this is not going to be your ordinary class we're going to create a program and the program we're going to create is going to ask the user to enter a number then it's going to ask the user to enter another number and then the program is going to add those two numbers together and display the results on the screen. Now, the reason I'm doing this, I thought it would be fun and a lot of you guys have been requesting that I do a tutorial on how to create a program. So here we go. Now let's uh, maximize this here. The first thing we're going to need to do is create the shell of the program. So we're going to do dot model space small, right? Then hit it space a few times. We're going to do the dot data, right? This is data section, hit space a few times, we're going to do dot code, right? Hit enter, hit tab, main, hit space, P-R-O-C, hit enter a few times, backslash, and P, we're going to end the main method here. Then we're going to end the program with this end main, right? All right, so this is the shell of the program right now, right? So in this dot data section here, this is where we're going to declare all our variables. And I'm going to declare a few variables that I'm going to use to display messages or strings on the screen. Now, the first one I'm going to call message. So M-E-S-S-A-G-E. -S -S -E. I'm going to hit space. I'm going to give it a data type. I'm going to give it a DB data type. I'm going to hit space. we got to use this open and close parentheses, right? Inside this open and close parentheses, we're going to type a message. And I want to type out enter a number, right? Hit, and I'm going to hit space. Now the space is a character too. Now if we don't add this space, everything that the program would add to the to the console will be clumped together. So it will, it will look funny. So remember, so remember a space is a character. So after the space, we're going to enter this dollar symbol. Now this dollar symbol is important. If you don't enter this, then the program doesn't know when to end the string. So we have to have that at the end of the string here. And inside the string, we need this set of double quotes there. So that's our first message. Now our second message here, I'm going to call message two. So M-E-S-S-A-G-E, -S -S -E, number two. This is a variable re declaring, and it's going to have a DB data type again. I'm going to hit space, two double quotes, a set of double quotes, right? Now inside the set of double quotes, we're going to type in another message. Now I'm going to type in space first, because remember, space is a character, and I don't want all this to clump together. Then I want to type in enter. A, another no oh, you and another number right and then I'm gonna hit B between here then I'm gonna hit space remember space is a character then we're gonna end this with this dollar symbol here now 
we have two messages and, and we declared a variable and these are our messages and they are strings. Now we're going to create another message, right? And I'm going to call this one message three. Let's go back here. So M E S S A G double S A G E. I'm going to type in three. So this is message three. It's going to be a data byte. I'm going to hit space. We need a set of double quotes, right? Inside a set of double quotes, I'm going to type in space again. Then I'm going to type in this equal symbol. Then I'm going to type in space again. So basically, as you can see, it's going to enter. It's going to prompt the user to enter a number. Then uh, we're going to put in some code so uh, it accepts a character from the user. Once we read that character, it's going to uh, print out again. Enter another number, right? Then we're going to have a space. Then, it, then it, we're going to accept another string. Then in the program, it's going to add those two numbers together. Then, then it's going to display this equal symbol. Remember, we want spaces between this equal symbol because otherwise the, the program will clump all this together, right? Then after that, I'm sorry, this should be a plus symbol because we're adding. So this is going to be a plus symbol first. And then now we're going to create the equal symbol. So this, that's going to be message four. Four, we can hit space. It's going to be a data byte again. Hit space, open and close parentheses. Again, I forgot to add this uh, dollar symbol at the end of this. Remember, it's very, very important that you add the dollar symbol or else the program will not know that the string has ended or the, that the variable has ended. So again, we're going to type in a message. I'm going to hit space, then this equal symbol here in space again. So again, from the top, the program is going to prompt the user to enter a number, right? Then the program will... Uh, request a number, we'll enter a number, it'll be saved in the program, then uh, it's going to prompt the user to enter another number, we'll enter a number, it'll get saved in the program, right? So then it's going to print out, uh, then I'm going to have the, the program print out the two numbers, right? Then in between the two numbers, this plus symbol, then at the end of this two numbers, this equal symbol, then it's going to print out the results. So we got our four uh, variables here. These are our four strings. So let's type the code first. So the first thing we're going to need to do is we've got to print out this first string on the screen, right? To do that, we're going to use the print string code. Now, just follow along. Now, the first thing we need to do is move into AX, right? The segment SEG of message, our first string we want to print out. So M E S S A G E, right? So that's. Now we're going to move into DS AX. Now the reason we're doing this is because we can't directly send the segment message to DS and we're going to need DS as the first part of our string. So now the first part is done, right? Now the second part, we're going to have to enter down here. And the second part, we're going to need to move into DX. And then we're going to move into DX to offset of our variable message here. So we can type in M-E-S-S-A-G-E, -S -S -E, right? Then we're gonna hit enter. That now we're gonna use the print string code, so move into A-H, then 9-H, right? So it's gonna print out our string on the, on the screen here. So to, to initialize it, we're going to have to type in I-N-T, hit space, 21-H. That's just like the code for do it. It initializes everything. So this here, prints uh, a string on the screen. And here we're going to just copy this later on and I'm just going to change the, our, our variables to save time. But if you guys want to learn how to print strings on the sc screen, this is how you do it here. So now we're going to type in the character input code. We want the user to enter a character, right? So we're going to type in MOV, hit space, and we're going to move into AH, uh, 1H. And this is the code for print, or this is actually this is the code for read character, I'm sorry. So then we're going to hit enter, right? So very important. Whatever the user enters is going to get stored in AL. So I'll just type that here. Stored in AL. So type in input stored in AL. Okay. So now, so now we, we, we've, uh, we have our input and it's stored in AL. So now the next thing I want to do is I want to move that first input into a new register. So we're going to move into BL, right? Because BL is going to store our first uh, input and we're going to move AL because AL has our input right now and because we're going to need to reuse AL again. So that's why we're moving it to BL for safekeeping now, right? So we're moving into BL, AL just to store our first input. Now we got to print out another uh, message here, our second message. And, and the second message is prompting the user to enter another 
number. So we don't have to retype this. We just kind of copy this part, first part here, right? This is the print string. And we're going to paste it under here. Then we're just going to change this to a message two. That's all we have to do, all right? So now it's going to print out the message two on the screen. Now we need some input from the user again. Now we need our second input. So again, I'm just going to copy this here. Remember, everything gets stored into AL. We, re we already we already moved our input into BL, so it's it's safe. So now we're just going to copy this input code here and paste it down here. We're going to do the same thing. Now we're, we're asking the user to enter a second number, right? Now we're going to move this second number into CL, another register, because remember, it gets stored in AL automatically. So we're going to move into CL, AL, so it gets stored. Okay. Now we're going to print out our first uh, input, right? And to do that, we're going to use the print character code. And this is how the print character code goes. We move into DL whatever we want we want to print out on the screen. And I want to print out the value of BL because BL and CL, they hold our uh, input, right? So the first one is BL. So we're going to type in BL here. So now we're moving into DL, BL. Now we're going to do the code here. We're going to uh, move into AH to H. And this is the code for print character. Now we're going to do INT. 21H to initialize it, right? So again, now we're printing out our first character here, which which is actually the first input. Now we need to uh, print out this plus symbol here because it's going to be our first number we entered. We're just printing it back out to the to the user. Whatever they entered is being printed out. Now we're going to print out this plus symbol back to them. To do that, we're going to copy this code here again. This is the print string uh, code, and we're just going to paste it under here. So I'm going to paste it here, right? And all we have to do is change the message. Now the plus is going to be message three. So I'm just going to add a three to the end of this here. So now we printed out this plus symbol. Now we have our first input and the plus symbol. Now we need our second input. To do that, we're going to copy this here. And I'm going to enter it down here. Now we're printing back our second input. And our second input is in seal. Remember that we saved it in seal. So BL has our first input and CL had our second. So that's why we're moving into DL so it can get printed. And this is the print character code here. Move into AH, 2H, then INC 21H. Now it's going to print on the screen our third input. Now we want to uh, uh, type in this final message here, which is this equal symbol. So again, we got to um, copy this here, paste it down here, and it's message for the equal symbol, right? So we're going to paste it under here. And we're going to type in message four, four. So now it's going to print out message four and it's going to be this equal symbol here. So now remember BL and CL hold our two inputs, right? So now we got to do the math. But before we do the math is whenever you uh, use this uh, input code here to input a, any type of character, it inputs it as a character. If you if you want to do math, you have to convert it into a decimal. Now to convert it to a decimal, we have the first thing we got to do is uh, subtract, and we got to subtract uh, the reg our first register, which is BL, which stores our first input, right, by 30H. This will uh, convert it into decimal. Now we're going to do the same thing with our other register that holds our second uh, character. So now we're going to do the same thing with CL, because CL holds our second input, so we're going to subtract CL by 30H, right? So now we're going to do the math. We're going to add uh, BL with CL. So what, what's going to happen is they're going to add our two inputs together, right? We converted them into decimal. So it's going to add those two together and the results are going to get stored in BL. So now the sum is going to be in BL. So now before we print out the sum, we got to do a few things. Now, uh, the, uh, remember, sum is in BL. Now we got to add into BL 30H back because we, we wanted to convert it back into a character. So it prints the character on the screen. So we added into BH 30H again. So now we're going to uh, print character. We're going to use the code for print character. And we're going to copy it from right here. This is the code for print character. And we're going to enter it under here, right? So we hit paste. So now uh, we want to move into DL. BL because BL holds our sum of our uh, the two inputs together, right? So now it's going to print uh, that onto the screen. Right, so let's make sure everything's all right before I hit emulate. 
And uh, as you can see right here, I forgot to add this dollar symbol here at the end of this message five. Without this, the program will know that this is ending. So let's tr hit emulate up here. Let's hit run. So now it's asking us to enter a number. I want to enter two. So now it's asking us to enter another number. I'm going to enter two again. And as you can see, two plus two equals four. As easy as that. All right, if you guys are interested and you guys want to uh, try this out for yourself, I'm going to leave the source code in my website. So go to my website, rossmertech.com. Go to classes, assembly programming, and, and it should be the last class. Click on it, then you, you should be able to copy the source code from there. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rustin from rossmertech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rustin from rossmartech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to show you guys how to use the ADC instruction and it's short for add with carry. So let's get started. Now the ADC instruction adds both the source operand and the contents of the carry flag to the destination operand. The instruction formats are the same as the add instruction and I'm going to show you that right now. This is the different formats, it's exactly the same as the add instruction. You can uh, add, you can ADC uh, registers into registers. You can ADC uh, registers into memory. You can ADC memory into registers. You can ADC immediate values into memory, and you can ADC immediate values into registers. Same as the add instruction. All right, now let's open MU8086 so I can show you exactly how this instruction works. Let's minimize this here. Now let's first start off by writing a few instructions here. Let's let's type in MOV DL. Zero. This is the example that's in the book. If you guys are following along with me with this book, the book is called Kip R. Ivrin's uh, Assembly Language for X86 Processors. This is the example that they have in the book. So if you guys want to follow along and you have the book, you can do so. Now, the first instruction we're going to type in is move into DL0, right? We want to move into DL the value of zero. And let's type in the next instruction. The next instruction we're moving into AL. And this uh, hexadecimal value here, 0, F, F, H, right? And now we're adding into AL the same amount, 0, F, F, H, right? These are two capital Fs, by the way, lowercase f. Now let's do the final part. We're going to use the ADC instruction, right? And we're going to add in ADC into DL the value of zero. So let's see what happens, right? All right, so let me show you exactly what's gonna happen on here. All right, so let us let me just type it in here so you guys get an idea of what's gonna happen. So we're adding, right, into AL. We're adding basically this value here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me open up MU8086 here so I can explain what, what, what why this is this value. So uh, we moved into uh, basically AL this hexadecimal value and I'm going to copy this here I'm going to open up my browser right and in this browser I have this uh, binary to hexadecimal to decimal converter and I'm going to paste my decimal uh, value here in the hexadecimal part I'm going to hit paste and I'm going to hit enter and as you can see this is the binary uh, part of it this is the binary value of that hexadecimal value right so again, we're moving this binary value into AL now. So let's open up MU8086 again. So again, now we're adding that same amount into AL because we want the carry flag to be set to one. So basically it's adding this here. It's adding uh, one, 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 one into, let's add this plus symbol here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this value here, and it's gonna set the carry flag. So. This is going to be the results of AL. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then 0. And the carry flag is going to be set. So now let us let me show you what happens with DL, right? So we, we're basically, we're, we're adding a 0 into DL, right? And then we're adding 0 back to it. So let's just type that in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? Then it's gonna we're gonna add it by by another zero, right? We moved into uh, DL zero first. Then we're adding zero back into DL, but it's eight zeros because it, it's a eight bit value. So this is the binary uh, eight bit value of zero. It has to be all zeros, and we're adding this back into uh, the DL register, right? But uh, when we use this ADC instruction, right, what's gonna happen is it's going to uh, 
it's going to add the two together, but it's going to also add the, the carry flag along with it. So it's going to copy this part into AL, right? The carry flag is going to get uh, sent to DL, and I should have wrote DL down here, right? And now DL is going to look like this, basically. It's going to have seven zeros, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a one, because it carried the, the carry flag over to DL. Remember that. So then now after this, we, we should have this 16-bit value. It's going to be DL and AL together, which is going to make a 16-bit value, right? It's going to have a hexadecimal value of this right here. 0, 1, F, E, H. And I'm going to show you how that's going to happen in a second. Let's open up MU86 here again. So we can run this here. Again, we started off by moving into DL0, right? Now, right, we're moving into AL, this hexadecimal value, which is also the same as this binary value here, eight once, right? So the reason we're doing that is because we want to set the carry flag. So now down here, we're adding into AL the same value. So the carry flag was, is set. So it's adding another eight ones, and it's going to give us this value here, right? And it's going to set the carry flag to one. So, right, so let's hit play here. I'm going to hit emulate. So our first line of code here is highlighted. Move into DL, the value of zero. So I'm going to hit single step here. And as you can see, DL still has a value of zero here. So now our second line of code is highlighted. Move into AL, this hexadecimal value here, right? So I'm going to hit single step. As you see, AL has this hexadecimal value. And I'm going to prove to you exactly what the value is by copying this here, right? I'm going to copy FF. I'm going to open up my binary to hexadecimal to decimal converter, right? I'm going to paste it onto this hexadecimal part here. Then I'm going to hit enter. As you can see, it's the same thing. This is the binary of... Uh, this hexadecimal value here, FF. So let's open up MU8086 again. So our third line of code here, we're adding into AL the same amount. So we're adding basically this again. Let's open up Notepad. We're adding this value with this value, which is going to give us this value. And it's going to set the carry flag. So let's open that up again. Let's hit single step. And as you can see here, AL now has a value of FE. So let's Copy this and let's see if it worked. Let's open up this uh, binary to hexadecimal to decimal converter. Let's again paste it onto hexadecimal here. Now FE and let's hit enter. And this is our answer here. Seven ones and one zero. This is another 8-bit value, right? And it set the carry flag. And I, and I remember I showed you that this would be the result here. And we got it when we ran the program, right? So again, now the next part, the carry flag is going to be set, right? And that carry flag is going to be, be added onto the DL register. We, we started off by moving into DL, the value of zero, right? Then we're adding into DL zero. But just to show you, you know, zero plus zero is always going to be zero, but it's going to add the carry flag to DL because it's going to carry it over. And let's open up MU8086 here just to show you how that works. So let's hit single step here. And as you can see right now, DL here has a value of one because it carried the carry flag into DL. So AL has a value of FE. So let's copy this here, right? Let's paste it onto this part again. FE is this value here. L here has a value of FE. It's FEH, by the way. And uh, DL has a value of 0, 1. So that's how we got the, this 16-bit value, 0, 1 in DL, right? And FEH in AL. And this makes a 16-bit value here. And let's copy this 16-bit value. I'm going to copy it here. Let's open up this converter here, and I'm going to paste it here. And let's hit Enter. And this is the 16-bit value here. Pretty cool, right? So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rustin from RustinMartech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up, guys? I'm Rustin from RustinMartech.com, and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now, in this class, I'm going to show you guys how to use the SBB instructions. So let's get started. Before we get started, now I know a lot of you guys have been having problems downloading and installing MU8086. So I uh, put up a new link to MU8086. It's a RAR file, so you don't have to worry about how to extract it. It's just a regular RAR file. 
And I'm gonna leave the link in this description. If you guys have any questions and you have any concerns about installing MU8086, you can email me at support at rossmertech.com and I'll help you guys out. And again, that link is also gonna be in the description. So let's get started. So what is the SBB instruction? The SBB instruction subtracts both the source operand and the value of the carry flag from the destination operand. So let's get started and I'll show you exactly what it does so let's maximize this here and uh, the first thing we're gonna need to do we're gonna move into a h the value of seven now we're going to uh, move into b h the value of one now we're going to subtract uh, from b h to all right and finally, we're going to use the SBB instruction, right? This is the SBB instruction here. And we're going to type in our uh, destination operand. Our destination operand is AH. And the source operand is going to have a value of zero. So again, uh, the, the way the SBB instruction works, it subtracts the value of the source operand and the carry flag, whatever the value of the carry flag, if it has a one or a zero, uh, so both together subtract into the destination operand. So let's say uh, right now um, we have a value of 7 in AH, right? Well, we're using a move into BH and we're subtracting the value of 2 from BH so we can uh, trigger the carry flag, right? So if, whenever you subtract a bigger number into a smaller number, the carry flag is set. So we want the carry flag to be set. So when we use the SBB instruction, the carry flag will be set. So the carry flag should have a value of 1, right? And 1 and 0 is 1, so 1 subtract the destination operand, which has a value of 7. So 7 take away 1 is 6. So when this is done, uh, AH should have a value of 6. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate here. All right, so right here, let's actually bring up our flags here too so you guys can see. I'm going to put the flags here. Now, our first line of code is highlighted. Move into AH7, so let's hit single step. Our second line of code here is highlighted move into BH value one. As you can see here, once I hit single step, BH has a value of one and uh, AH has a value of seven. Now we're gonna use the subtract instruction, right? We're gonna subtract uh, two from uh, the value of BH, which has a value of one. So that should trigger the carry flag. So let's hit single step here. And as you can see, the carry flag has been triggered and has a value of one. Now, our final line of code is highlighted, the SBB instruction. So basically the SBB instruction, what's gonna happen is the SBB instruction is gonna take the value of the carry flag, right? If the carry flag is set and has a value of one, or if the carry flag has a value of zero, it's gonna take that. Uh, basically, you're adding it with the source operand, right? So if the carry flag was set, right, and it had a value of 1, it would add to 0. So 0, 1 is 1, and 1 would subtract uh, into AH, right? So basically, AH has a value of 7, so 7 take away 1 would be 6. So the value of AH should have a value of 6. So let's test it out again and hit single step. As you can see over here, AH has a value of 6. I'm going to explain from the top. We moved into AH, the value of 7, right? So AH had a value of 7. We moved into BH, the value of 1. So we subtract uh, uh, BH, with, uh, which has a value of 1, with 2 to set the carrier flag. Remember, when you subtract a bigger uh, number into a smaller number, it, it triggers the carry flag. So now, since the carry flag is set, we're going to use the SBB instruction. Now, the SBB instruction subtracts uh, whatever value is in the carry flag together with uh, the source operand into the destination operand. So a 7 take away 1 equals 6. Remember, uh, there was a 0 here, but our carry flag had a 1, so 7 take away 1 gave us a 6. And that's pretty much it. So that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rustin from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching. What's up guys, I'm Rustin from RossmerTech.com and this is another tutorial in assembly programming. Now in this class I'm going to show you guys how to use the AAA instruction short for ASCII adjust after addition. So let's get started. Now what is the AAA instruction? The AAA instruction adjusts the binary results of a add or a ADC 
instruction, assuming that AL contains a binary value produced by adding two ASCII digits. AAA converts AL to two unpacked decimal digits and stores them in AH and AL. Once in unpacked format, AH and AL can easily be converted to ASCII by ORing them with 30H. And I'll show you exactly how that works. The first thing we're going to need to do, we're going to move into AH. The value is zero. So we want to set AH to zero. So when we use the AA instruction, we have no problems. We have to set AH to zero or else uh, the values are going to change later on. So that's important. So now we're going to move into AL, the value of ASCII 8. So ASCII 8 is two single quotes. In between two single quotes, it's the digit 8, right? So we're moving into AL, the ASCII 8. So now we're going to add into AL, ASCII 2. So again, two single quotes. In between two single quotes, we're going to add 2. So AL already had ASCII 8, and we're adding into AL ASCII 2. But remember, these are binary values right now. It hasn't been converted to ASCII yet. So now we're going to use the AAA instruction. Once we use the AAA instruction, what's going to happen is it's going to convert or adjust AH and AL. Uh, it's going to change them so that when we use the OR and we OR into AX, 30H, it's going to convert it to ASCII. It's just preparing, basically, so that when we OR, it'll convert it to ASCII. So now we're going to OR into AX, right? 30, 30H, and this is going to convert it into ASCII. So, so in here, it's going the AAA is going to adjust so that when we OR again, and we OR uh, the value of 3030H into AX. It's going to convert AX into ASCII code. And it should be ASCII 10 because ASCII 8 plus ASCII 2, then AX should equal ASCII 10. So let's test it out. I'm going to hit emulate here. Our first line of code here is highlighted, move into AH, the value of 0. Again, we're setting AH to 0. So I'm going to hit single step. And AH is still 0, as you can see here. So now our second line of code here is highlighted, move into AL, ASCII 8. So once I hit single step here, AL should have uh, ASCII 8. And uh, this is uh, 38H, right? Is ASCII 8, basically. And now uh, our third line here is highlighted to add. We're adding AL with ASCII 2. Remember, AL already had ASCII 8, so we're adding ASCII 2, so that should make ASCII 10. But if, if we don't use the AAA and OR, it's, it won't be converted to ASCII. It'll still be binary. So let's hit single step here. Now AL here has a value of 6A, a hexadecimal value of 6A. So now our uh, fourth line of code here is highlighted the AAA instruction. Once I hit single step, it'll uh, adjust AH and AL. So I'm going to hit single step here. And now uh, AX has a value of 0100H. So now our final line of code here is highlighted, and we're ORing AX with 3030H, so we're converting uh, AX to ASCII. So let's hit single step. Now AX has a value of 3130H, which is ASCII for 10. So let's test it out. I have this uh, converter here, and it's I got it from www.brana.com forward slash ASCII slash converter. And I'll leave a link in the description. This is a neat converter that I found useful. So again, we got 3130H, right, in AX. And as you can see up here, I converted it to ASCII 10. So 3130H is ASCII 10. And I'll open this over here. And as you can see, our, our AX had 3130H, which converted it to ASCII 10. As easy as that. I'm going to explain again from the beginning. So we started off. Let's just close this here first. Let's close this here. We started off by um, moving into AH to value 0. So we're setting AH to 0. Now our second line of code here is highlighted. Move into AL ASCII 8, right? So we're moving into AL ASCII 8. So basically, so AX at this point is equal to 0038H, right? So now when we add into AL ASCII 2, AX should be equal to zero zero six a h right a is capital here now when we use the aa instruction ax should be equal to zero one zero zero h 
And our final line of code here, when we're oring AX with 3030H, AX will finally become 3130H, basically equal to uh, ASCII 10, right? And another single quote. Guys, okay, so that's pretty much it for this video. If you guys like this video, please give me a like. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. I'm Rissin from RossmerTech.com, and thanks for watching.